right, welcome everyone back to the Nasty Guys channel. Uh, we have a pretty big broadcast today, and we're here with uh, brothers JP, Paul Day, and also Church of Christ Preachers. Uh, I don't hear you anymore. No, yeah, I, I don't lost hear him either. No, I lost him too. Here, I can, I can kind of, I guess, fill in for him. We have uh, Travis, uh, Church of Christ preacher from Tennessee. Travis, if you want to introduce uh, your friends, go right ahead. Well, everyone knows me pretty much. It's on these shows. <laughs> uh, they're uh, adults, so they can introduce themselves. Okay, go right ahead, uh, Michael, if you want to go first. Well, I'm Michael Sullivan. Uh, I'm a Christian. I'm a... Uh... And Walnut Grove Church of Christ here in uh, Tennessee. Hey guys, what's going on? Sorry about that. My internet just went out on me. I think it's just because we have a storm, or whatever. So I apologize for that. But uh, yeah, so uh, just really quick, we got the Church of Christ preachers. They wanted to comment on the video that we uh, did. It was an open discussion. We started talking about the uh, Church of Christ, and so I think that's what uh, Travis uh, initially wanted to speak on. And of course, we got JP and also Paul Day, who also uh, has some commentary on this as well. Uh, Paul Day being a former Church of Christ member, and JP as well was former uh, Church of Christ. So this will be interesting. Uh, so uh, before we get uh, started, I'm gonna go ahead and help my wife really quick. But JP, if you want to get us uh, kicked off, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Um, okay. Michael, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for oh. introducing yourself. Uh, Shane, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, sir, go ahead. I'm Shane Fisher. Uh, I am a member of the Church of Christ, and also I am a missionary. I go to primarily to India and other places of the world to preach the gospel. So great to be here. Amen. Good stuff, sir. Uh, as far as, like he said, the um, concerns that Travis had with the representation uh, of his church that he attends, um, Travis, if you want to go ahead and yeah, uh, I've got to bring you know, in the video. Oh, okay. Um, I, I don't know. You probably can you share it? Uh, no, I don't have any access to his channel on that. Do um, you want to maybe go over some points of the video, and then when we get him back, we can play the video? Uh, well, I would say to everyone in here uh, would agree that we should try our best not to misrepresent as far as what other people believe and teach. Uh, wouldn't you guys agree with that? Sure. Amen. Okay. Now I know too, and JP, you know, and Paul, you know that uh, whenever I do make videos or reviews, I do take certain sections and cut them out because if it's a two hour video and here's an example uh, I mean, Paul Day, you believe that we're that we would be saved by faith alone, right? You hold that view. You don't have to go into great detail about teaching it, but yes, as I have already made plain in our previous debate, yes, right. So if I played you saying that we're saved by faith alone, and then I elaborated on why that isn't true, that wouldn't be necessarily misrepresenting you uh, in that sense. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, I would. I would agree with it, provided that you explained it the way I explained it, which I don't think you're capable of doing. Well, let's uh, let's uh, let's not uh, do all the hostility here. I know I just came back or not. Let's uh, just get started first with uh, with you guys. First, explain what is the Church of Christ, and then we can just kind of go 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 from there. Okay, uh, but let me sh share this uh, the video, and then I want to build up. Yeah, there we go. This is why I wanted to meet with you guys. Let me just play this. <clears throat> uh, did you share audio? Because I can't hear it. Okay, let me see if I can turn it up. The water baptist uh, uh, prominent, or, or are they not? Is it, what's, their, what's, what's the one thing that you least Okay, could y'all hear that? Yeah, we can hear it. That's okay. Well, it, would, it would be water baptism. They do, they do say that you had to be water baptized. Fully immersed, 
You can't have any skin out or anything like that. You gotta be fully first before it hurts. Oh, they're particular Harlan. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those like I said, it needs to be like their special water, too. Oh. Okay, so the Harlan Brothers are the ones that are doing it. Uh, I have no problem with what Desmond said that we fully believe in immersion, but is it Remy? Uh, Joe. Okay. Well, Joe. Joe yeah. Okay. Well, he made a statement. He's like, I'm really not too sure what the Church of Christ believes. But then Philip says, he says that he heard that we have to have our own special water. And so I thought, well, you know. Desmond, you and I have debated, and you know good and well I've never brought up any kind of special water. So it was kind of like whenever someone says something like that, you got Ivan in the room, and Ivan hears that. So now you have people going off. You know, I heard on another program that they said the Churches of Christ teach that you have to be baptized by an elder. And I'm like, where did that come from? So you know how that's how rumors and, and mis representation starts and that's kind of why I wanted to talk to you about this <clears throat> you guys see that my point I mean well you it's you know it'd be nice to have Philip here to let him clarify exactly what he meant by that uh, just in, in hearing that I'm thinking that it's possible that he is referring to a situation where Church of Christ does not honor a person's water baptism unless it's done in the Church of Christ. Is that your position of your church, that a person has to be water baptized in your church, in a Church of Christ, to be valid? Well, several things with that, JP. I don't ha we don't come yeah. and represent our church. We're representing, we're just Christians, and it's the Lord's church. So, do you have to be added or baptized into Christ, which would place you into the body of Christ? Yes. So you can't be baptized into a Baptist church because the Baptist church was would not be in the church of Christ, which is the body of Christ. See? Well, you know that I understand your position well on that. And I'm just, because Philip's not here, when he uses the terminology special water, he could be alluding to that situation that that your church will recognize the baptism if it's done within your your walls of your church and someone couldn't get baptized in a baptist church and then come to your church and then a preacher not say well we need to talk about some things here because we think you've been taught wrong and you need to get baptized for the right reason right well, what do you think that meant, Paul Day? I mean, it's special water. If someone says they've got to use special water, their water, what? how would you not, you just put yourself in their shoes that you don't know anything. What in the world does that mean, special water? Uh, based on my experience from, from my time among the Churches of Christ, there, there was a, a, a rumor, sometimes an outright false misrepresentation that those in the Church of Christ do teach that there's some sort of power in the water. That is something that the vast majority of them would flatly deny. So uh, if that was his opinion, it was an erroneous opinion. Um, that certainly is not the majority report among the Churches of Christ. But as far as what JP was mentioning earlier, as far as who, who does the baptism among the churches of Christ, the circles that I used to um, be involved in, the, yes. the, vast, the vast majority uh, hold to the view that any member of the Church of Christ can perform a baptism and it would be considered valid. Um, however, there, are, there is a difference of, a, of opinion. Uh, it's a minority report. Some people will say it has to be done by an evangelist. Some, day, some will say it has to be done by an elder, but most of them do agree that any member of the Church of Christ um, can baptize an individual and it can be considered valid. There are a few people who will say that someone outside the church could baptize someone as long as they understood that baptism was in order to re obtain the remission of sins as well. Mm -hmm. Well, Actually, my internet just went out, so Shane and Michael, I don't even know what Paul said, so I thought I got 
I thought uh, he was playing it pretty well. Yeah, he was basically right on. You know, the the key is is just uh, understanding that it's it's the correct doctrine. It's it's they have to understand that it is for the remission of their sins. And be, uh, before we get into the whole baptism thing, too, um, because I know we we just started talking about the uh, churches of Christ, and that you know you guys don't really have like a, uh, I think JPS. You know, you have to get baptized within the walls of your church. And you're correct to him, Travis, saying that. You know, uh, we're just Christians. I wanted to uh, reference something really quick. I just want to see if you guys agree with this. I went to another Church of Christ uh, website, and it's, it's just like it has like a directory of a whole bunch of uh, all the churches of Christ across the uh, across the world. And they kind of give like a little overview of, of the Church of Christ. I just want to read a little bit of the history here and see if you guys agree with this as well, uh, because I've hear I heard different things from different churches of Christ. There was one here on the north side of St. Louis that I attended for about six months before I left because I had moved. Uh, so I didn't see much difference than what I actually would, uh, believe until I met Travis. But let me share this here. And this is Churches of Christ, Internet Ministries, and they just have a whole bunch of resources that will link you to the Church of Christ. But they they link their personal history to uh, back into, the, well, like I say, 1793. Uh, talking about James O'Kelly and says he withdrew from the Baltimore uh, conference of his church and called upon others to join him in taking the Bible as his only creed. Uh, his influence was largely felt in Virginia and North Carolina, where history records uh, that some 7,000 communicants followed his leadership toward a return to primitive New, uh, New Testament Christianity. So essentially, like there's a group of people back in the early 1800s uh, that felt they need to return back to New Testament roots. And so that's where you get the, uh, the names like Thomas uh, Campbell, Alexander Campbell, as it states later on. As a matter of fact, it says Thomas Campbell and his illustrious son, Alexander Campbell, took similar steps in the year 1809 in what is now the uh, state of West Virginia. And they contend that nothing should be bound upon Christians as a matter of, uh, of doctrine, which is not as old as the New Testament. Although these four movements were completely independent in their beginnings, eventually they became one strong restoration movement because of a common purpose and plea. These men did not advocate for starting a new church, but rather return to Christ's church as described in the Bible. So like when we ask you guys about your history, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, this is the reason why you guys don't see yourselves as a, another denomination or, you know, uh, or we say like, oh, you got to go to your church, whatever. You guys just see you guys, you guys see yourselves as just Christians and that's it because of what's stated here. You guys are just trying to return back to the New Testament roots. Is that right? Amen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so with, with that, uh, Shane has prepared something. Do you care if he goes over this principle about the seed and how, you know, Desmond, do you think that restoration is unbiblical? No. Uh, I mean, because like, like, I, I, there's, there's a lot of things I can do agree with the Church of Christ. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that was lost. Uh, uh, when I say lost, I mean like as far as like practices, uh, how we do how we view certain things because the New Testament Bible or uh, New Testament Christians, uh, the way they gather together, the way they uh, worship together, I believe uh, we lost a lot of that in our attempt to become more organized. Yeah, uh, I think a, I think a better word there would be changed. Actually, Jasmine, Desmond, instead of lost. Uh, yeah, it depends. It depends how you look at. It. Yeah, change or lost. Then uh, it also depends on the church. Um, I know, like personally, like my Baptist church, for example. Uh, I have no issues with it. I mean, like, there, there's a, a, a more of a New Testament feel to it than most churches I've been to. But I get the idea of where you guys are coming from, at least historically speaking. Uh, but I just wanted to get that out the way as well. So that way, when we do you know, use these terms, that we don't get confused. Because a lot of people are saying, well, are, are these guys a denomination or are, are they not a denomination? You know, what's the history behind that? I just want to kind of record that because a lot of times if we just say, well, we're just Christians, that leaves a lot of history out of it, and people don't really understand where you're coming from. That's the reason I want to read that. Well, well, what about you, JP? Do you believe that restoration is, <clears throat> could we find examples within the Bible of about going back to maybe the principles that were taught within the Bible? Well, in, in regards to this conversation, you know, we're, we're looking at the history of, of your church. I know you would say it's, it's the original church. Are, are you taking the position that you're acknowledging that your church had a starting point, or are you saying that your church was before 
Alexander Campbell and is it Stone? You know, which position are you guys taking instead of us defining the word restoration? You know, let's just get to the heart of the matter. I mean, wh which yeah. is it for you guys? Well, will you continue – in Acts 20, 28, it says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. So I don't continue to say my church because I believe that Jesus built a church. And so it's not my church. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware that you, you take that position. And most of us should. I'm a, I'm a Genesis to Revelation guy. I don't adhere to restoration movements or church fathers. None of them are inspired. So I don't really uh, recognize much of it at all. So it, it doesn't, if you're asking me restoration movements and things like that, um, don't, don't hold much weight with me at all. That's my opinion. Uh -huh. Well, Paul, uh, Paul day, you would, you would believe that restoration is a biblical principle, isn't it? There are certain things within the Old Testament um, that are definitely examples of restoration, but I do not believe that it is taught or implied in the New Testament that the church that Jesus is building currently would ever disappear from the face of the earth. I believe that is a complete denial yeah. of the promise yeah. of Jesus. Okay. But none of us ever said that the church that Jesus built was removed completely from the face of the earth. Just, you, just haven't, it out there. you haven't verbally <laughs> said that yet, but your own history books say that emphatically and clearly. So if, if you want to deny what they say, that, that's okay. That's good if you don't want to take that position. But historically, the, the historians within your own movement have affirmed that the, the church was, it disappeared from the face of the earth, and it took their founders to restore it. Okay. Well, I mentioned a little bit before we went around. Uh, do you do you guys mind for Shane to uh, present about the restoration? How how we can go back and how it no. is biblical? Do you, do you guys mind if he shares a slide? No, so so you, you you are affirming that it disappeared and it had to be restored. Is that the position you're taking no. before we watch it? No, you're, you're not. Okay. Well, we'll let him present it and then see. What you guys think? Yeah, well, okay, yeah, let me present first, and then we'll. I, I was just going to say, Paul, that I agree with you that 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 was erroneous position that was taken by some of the pe some people before. So, just want to let you know that. Um, yeah, no. yeah, mean, you can go ahead and share your screen. Yeah, you okay. can share your screen. I'll put it up for you. Okay. Uh, yep, it just came yeah. up here. Um, I, I guess I, I'll just go through this slowly, and y'all stop and. We can discuss it. I just want to know if what you disagree with, would that be all right? Yeah, is that's that, fine. Sure. Is that fine? Sure. Do I need to make it bigger or like that? That's fine right there, yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to just talk about the seed principle. And uh, Genesis 1, 11 through 13, of course, is the creation account. And if every seed produces after its own kind. And I think we all agree that if you plant pumpkin seeds, you're going to get a pumpkin. If you can plant watermelon seeds, you'll get a watermelon. And we see that uh, in Genesis 1, 11 through 13. Uh, I don't think I have to prove that. I think probably everybody agrees with that. And then the seed is the word of God. Uh, we find this in the parable of the sower as it's commonly called, Luke 8, verse 11. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. So, And then God's word and only God's word, not mixed with man-made error. And I think, um, you know, JP, you hit on it, that you want to be Genesis to Revelation uh, kind of guy. And I, we want to, you know, just follow what the Bible teaches. So... God's word not mixed with man-made air can produce plants after its own kind, Christians, because um, we honor the, na the name of Christ. We honor the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25, since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit, 
and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and his flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. So as we can see, um, there were uh, people who were born again and not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible with the word of God, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And then James talks about, he says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Um, I'm just going to go to that part in bold, if that's okay. Therefore, laying aside all filthiness, overflow witness, wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. So the word of God is able to save our souls. And then the soil represents the different types of hearts that will receive or not receive the word. And we know that Matthew 13, 18 through 23 talks about four different types of soil. There's the wayside, there's the stony ground, there's the thorny ground, there's the, the good soil. And I think we all uh, see what Jesus' interpretation of that is as found here. I don't think, um, uh, if you want to read it, we can read it if you like. Uh, I just want to, I think everybody would agree well, that it's re representing different types of hearts, right? Yes. And then, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the interest of time, I apologize. So just in the interest right. of time, I just kind of want to see if we can get to like the actual foundation of your sure. uh, yeah. I'm about church. to. It's almost over. Okay. And then uh, the father will uproot every plant that he did not plant. Now, of course, the context uh, with this, we the original context would be uh, Jesus, of course, facing off with the Pharisees. So, you know, they're the blind leaders of the blind and that the blind leads the blind. They both will fall into a ditch. Um, so, but I, I think we can see a principle here that can be uh, placed in that. You know, either we're going to receive the truth or we're not going to receive the truth. We're either going to receive the word of God or we're not going to receive the word of God. So I think that is to be proven. Based upon the type of hearts we have, yeah. Right. Therefore, a person must sow the pure seed into his or her heart in order to become a Christian. The, the word of God and only the word of God, not mixed with man-made error. And, um, you know, we got... We went through the second. The second premise is just basically the same. And I would just like to see: is is there something you all see here that is amiss? Do you disagree with something? I would just I'll, I'll throw up on the floor now. I don't have everybody on my screen anymore. Uh, yeah. So I was just uh, <laughs> hold on. Let me do this one. There we go. So if, if if no one uh, wants to fully object, I'm just curious, JP, uh, as he went through there, how how did you take that presentation? What did you get that we're trying to present? That's that's the great question right there. We we went from a conversation about the restoration movement and Alexander Campbell and and those guys to this seed presentation, and I'm I'm actually not seeing at all how you made a connection there. Okay. I mean, I was, I was following his verses and talking okay. about the seed. I get the seed principle and what he is um, presenting here. I'm not seeing how that proves restoration is necessary. I'm not seeing what his conclusion is with this. When, when he summed it up at the bottom and it says, a person must sow the pure seed into his heart. Um, I was like, wait a minute, is he grabbing a verse there? And then I realized, no, that's his own words and how he's um, concluding that. I would have some objections there. I have some questions about the first Peter verse that he has, but that's my thoughts on it. Okay. Well, Paul Day, do you un you understand what he's trying to present, right? Based on my own experience, uh, this argument is 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 basically the way that Shane is presenting it here is, is the idea that if you – present the word of God in its unadulterated fashion that you will produce Christians and Christians only. I think this is probably Amen. where it's going. 
Um, but normally, in my experience, when you use this seed argument, it's it's um, it's it comes with all the baggage of the restoration movement. It's to cover your bases just in case the church disappears from the earth. Therefore, the, the church can remain in seed form without the kingdom having disappeared from the earth. So that's why this argument is used. So you don't have to prove that the church of Christ, by their particular definition, existed prior to their time. When you have the, the seed being essentially the kingdom, everything, the kingdom could essentially disappear as far as member goes and still be the kingdom on earth. And then okay. you don't have to defend the restoration movement. So, so with all of that, Desmond, mm -hmm. if if I believe that the Church of Christ, uh, the physical part, did not exist at one point, but it still existed in seed seed form, if I believe mm -hmm. that, uh, or if I believe that it did continue to exist, even if it was a very small uh, in number through the dark ages, uh, either way, if I held either position, is it salvational? Would I go to hell for believing one or the other? Well, yeah. So the way I look at it, it kind of reminds me of like the other, not, I can't put you guys in the same group as like a, you know, as a cult obviously, but the, the things that kind of remind me of is like, you know, of course the Mormon church and other ones that say they were a restoration movement, uh, you know, trying to bring back the church and the, the issues I had, even if you have it in a seed form, it kind of seems like God was incapable of actually like preserving his word and preserving his church, even though he promised he would throughout scripture. And so like the question I would have is like, you know, historically speaking, you know, where was the church for the past? Uh, let me see. The movement started back in 1800, early 1800. So uh, 1800 years before that, what was the church doing? It was just. OK, but that's not really church. that's not really what I ask. I ask if you. If you is believe, it salvation? That's what I'm saying. Is if it, yeah. is it salvific? Yes, to yes, because again, it's it's question like the ability of God Himself. Okay, so that it's salvation. If I believe that it only existed in in seed form, that's that would be I would go to hell for that. But uh, Walter can believe one in the Godhead, and you're fine with him not going to hell. Okay, hang on. I got one question. Hold on before we get into that area uh -huh. okay when you're when you're presenting this possible scenario that the church could only exist in seed form the holy spirit has been delivered now i i need to know first if shane and michael affirm or deny the indwelling of the holy spirit the literal indwelling of the holy spirit in believers are, are you three in agreement on that? Because well, well really, you're jumping talk, talk, JP. No, it's not because you're talking about the church disappearing and only being in seed form. The Holy Spirit does not just disappear or stop working. So well, we, we really on, need to on. clarify. This. I'm not saying that it was. I'm saying if if one person holds this view and one person holds that view, would they go to hell over it? Yeah, and that's all I'm asking. That, that, I, that, understand, I understand that, but the Holy Spirit absolutely has implications in a discussion like that. A huge implication. Like how, you, you, would, you wouldn't get course. a church about the Holy Spirit. You're presenting a scenario that a lot of us don't even consider because we don't think that's possible because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Right. Now, I, I would like to know if you guys are in agreement on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, because I know Church of Christ is kind of split on it. So, okay, well, they can answer it, but let's not get off on that. You agree with uh, that? That's definitely? fair. Yeah, that's fair. I would just like that'll to be, know. That'll be next, then. But as far as uh, now, now that, that's the thing that you asked about Walter. That'll be a whole different conversation in and of itself. Though, that's as well. there. You go. That's so true we, too, we, so. we can't just jump to Walter and talk about modalism and and, and, and we'll deal that. with that, Travis. We'll deal with the Walter issue. I would just like to know from Michael and Shane if they affirm the literal indwelling of the Holy Spirit in believers today. Oh well, I don't think that there's anything miraculous going on today. Well, that doesn't really answer the questions. I don't believe people like Peter are raising people from the dead. I'm not talking about the the gifts and the powers of apostles. You know, yeah, I believe apostles. that we, I believe that we, we, yeah, we have the Spirit in us. But if you're a Christian, but there's nothing miraculous going on. 
Okay, so you recognize have, the literal indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay, Shane, what about you, sir? Well, now, I, I believe the Holy Spirit is in me, too. Okay. Can, I just want to make sure we understand. Um, can, can you define literal indwelling? I mean, that the Holy Spirit actually literally dwells in you? Is that what you're... Well, a lot of people have just explained the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as just a metaphor for the scriptures, the word of God that's you know, yeah. working out in your life. So, you know, when the scriptures say the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, the temple mm -hmm. of the spirit, you know, what's what's your explanation of that? It um, I kind of go with what Second Corinthians six sixteen talks about. Um, it uses that temple imagery and talks about how we as Christians are the temple of the spirit. And so um, the language there is used in the sense of God having fellowship with those who are obedient followers. And so that's how I take the indwelling. I mean, not just the indwelling of the spirit, but of the father and of the son. Do you, I mean, do you, do you believe in that the Father and the Son dwell? Yeah, in the Gospels, it said we will make our abode with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, absolutely. Okay. Okay, so, and as far as like the uh, restoration, because again, we, ha we have to just kind of get cleared on that. So with you guys, you guys don't trace yourselves back to that restoration movement. You guys trace yourselves all the way back to Christ themselves. Is that right? So you guys wouldn't just yes. like hold no. yourself, you know, hold Alexander Campbell or anybody like that as any sort of marker. Well, Shane, you, you brought mm -hmm. up about the the Corinthians became Christians 20 years. Mm -hmm. Remember how tell them just you know, explain yeah. that a little bit. Maybe so you know we have Paul the Apostle and many others who are in the book of Acts going around and they're establishing different congregations throughout their missionary well in particular throughout paul's missionary journey so i think y'all would agree that the true church that jesus built is being uh, established uh in the city of corinth for example in the around the 50s a.d would y'all sure agree with that so sure. if, if that could be 20 years why couldn't that be for 200 years that another congregation could get started? And then 2,000 years, another congregation who, that follows the seed principle, the pure seed, just the word of God. If I could jump in here, uh, this illustrates my point perfectly well, what I discussed earlier. Uh, we've gone from one argument to now another argument. Uh, instead of the, the seed being the word of God producing only Christians, now the, the, the kingdom of God can disappear from the face of the earth from 20 to 50 years. And even still with this example that was presented here by Shane is erroneous because there were other churches within that time period. So the church didn't disappear. The church was already in existence. So the example provided simply doesn't work. So, so what about your view, Paul? Do you believe if someone held one view and one held another view, is that even salvational? Because I'm wanting us to move along uh, because, I mean, if Michael believed that view, I don't think he's going to burn in hell, uh, you know, or Shane vice versa. So that's my that's my point is I don't think this is a salvational issue. What do you think, Paul? Trying to be as respectful here as I can. Um, we, we're, when we push issues, when we – when we push back on what's being presented by you, you want to deflect the discussion off into something else. Um, we've pointed out quite clearly that you're wanting to present two different arguments at the same time using this seed argument. One of them that the church does exist and one of them that it doesn't exist. And instead of wanting to engage in a discussion, you want to make this a, a war between people within the Knights of God group. That's not helpful. That's not a discussion. Um, we came here wanting in a discussion. So if, if we push back on a point, we would like to have interaction instead of having <laughs> Travis trying to direct the conversation. This is a group conversation. So if we say your argument is erroneous and you don't want to address it, that only makes your side look bad. 
No, no, what it is is I don't want to spend an hour and a half when we have a whole video to review. And basically, uh, you, you're, you just stated that we we're believing that the, the, the church did not exist. And we already said we believe it existed even if it was in seed form. And so that, that's why I'm saying that you're wanting to spend time on going on this one argument when there's more that I would like to discuss. So well, let, let, let's elaborate more on the seed form, though. So like, let's just say uh, in the second or third century, you would say it was in the seed forms so of those churches at the time. What would you consider those churches that were in existence? Say it one more time. The uh, so we can go back to the second and third century. Uh, since we were talking about the seed form, I just want to get more clarification on that because this is actually the first time I've heard about it. Um, so like the second, third, or even the fourth century. Uh, at what point, like those churches that existed at that time, were those apostate churches or were they? What? What? Because I'm not really understanding the seed form. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I think we're. How can I say it? Uh, I was talking to. Travis and Michael a little bit about this before the show started. I think, uh, Paul, uh, I, I agree with you already that, that that was an erroneous position to take by members of the church. Some, some members of the church of Christ who said that the church went into total apostasy, you know, uh, I don't, you know, I know exactly. And then it was restored in the 1800s. I mean, I, I believe the church, so to speak, is always, if they're following God's word, it, it, it exists. I mean, it's there. Um, does that make sense? I mean, am I? Yeah, I thought we were coming on here to maybe push against that, but you're actually coming on and saying, hey, they were wrong. The restoration, you know, from just a blacked out church that disappeared is false. So I feel like that's that's all cleared up. I mean, um I mean, that, would be, that, that would be our position. We trust the word of God and that God preserved his word and it, it never disappeared. So if we're all in agreement on that, that's great. Yeah, I think what, I think what yeah. Travis was saying is really either side is irrelevant because it's not a salvation issue. You've well, also, is what a, That's what I didn't understand. What's the debate about what's salvific? I, that I, you were losing me on. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would say this. If, if one person believes that the church somehow disappeared or I don't know, just like for a mere moment of time, which is gone, and 50 years later it came back and see it formed in another 100 years, I would say that would be solid. But only because it, it it diminishes what God said in his word. He said he will you know, uh, preserve his church throughout all, all time. Whatnot. So uh, for that 50 years right there, all the way up until the next 2,000 years, the whole 2,000 years, the church is always there no matter what. Not in seed form, in the full Holy Ghost-filled <laughs> form of the church. Uh, just like you would see back, you know, when the church got, first got started, not talking miracles in, in, in of itself, but that the church itself is being sealed until the day of redemption, as it says in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, and of course, Ephesians 4, 30, you know, that the church is sealed. So it's never going to be just in seed form. It's always there in, in its full dynamic form. Well, and I would agree with kind of what you're saying, Desmond, that it that it is a, a very tough thing to say that the Holy Spirit just disappeared and, and dis, disconnected from believers and, and the children of God. You know, that that is a pretty tough thing to say when you take the implications of what the Holy Spirit has done for believers. But with what Walter, I mean, with what Travis brings up with Walter, Travis, you got to understand that that there are people in our group that don't recognize Walter as a brother in Christ just because, you know, I may have my opinion about Walter and Desmond has his, that doesn't mean that everybody in our group recognizes his modalism and accepts him as a brother in Christ. We've, I wasn't, we've had I wasn't people, saying that I'm comparing, I'm comparing what we've been talking about for 30 minutes where I want to move on as someone burning in hell, you know, but yet when Walter does come on, I've heard you, I've heard you actually say brother, to him and other ones say brother. So that's, that's the that's point the I'm one. making. That's can, the point I'm making. I mean, I'll, I'll call, he can I'll have call whoever Walter. he wants on there. You know, he can have anyone he wants on there. And, but and, I'm and, just and, trying to show that it, that's just like straining a gnat on this argument that we're discussing but, by but, believing in uh, what he believes was Walter. I, but I don't see the parallel at all. And like I said, I'll call Walter brother, but there's other people that don't. And I'm saying we accept 
everybody's views and we we are trying to learn from each other and we don't just mark and avoid people and and shun them away like the whole witness I'll, I'll mention this too though i'll mention this on uh walton and we can just move on to the next topic as well travis as far as walt is concerned uh there's two two different groups of modalists there's a modalist group that we dealt with uh i'm not gonna mention their name but they say you have to believe that jesus is the father in order to be saved now those guys i would consider just complete heretics because again the bible doesn't say that now, whether Walter, you know, a person can have a misconstrued view of God, let's just say, you know, they believe uh, that God is, you know, Jesus, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, do we have to believe that Jesus is the Father? Well, no. Walter here affirms you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He didn't say you have to believe that Jesus is the Father. That's his personal view. If, if Walter was pushing that, I would have a problem. But since he wasn't, he affirms that you have to believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We can actually work with that and continue talking about that over, uh, moreover. Uh, like I said, the purpose of the channel is to talk about all views and not just hold my view as like the superior one. I want all views to be talked about so that way people can hear and then, of course, test that against the word of God. But before we get off into Walton and all that, let's move on to the next topic as well. OK. And, and can, can uh, uh, point? go right. ahead. I just want to ask, would you, uh, JP and J Paul and Desmond, would you all agree that, uh, you know, First Timothy 4 and 1 says some, it says some will depart from the faith. It doesn't say all. So I think we're in agreement on that. I mean, but do you agree um, that throughout the centuries that there have been various departures from the faith, whether it be maybe the view of God, for example, um, like you were just talking about, um, like Arianism, for example? Do you see yeah, what I'm sure. saying? I mean, do you, do you agree that there were departures from the faith? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's people who... Who, who heard the true gospel and just went away from them. I mean, the Bible's pretty clear about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, All right. The only other thing I want to add here as we end, we end this part of the discussion, nowhere in this argument has there been a scripture produced yet that says the kingdom exists in seed form. There is no scripture that said that seed is the kingdom. The only thing that's been presented so far is that the the uh, the uh, the seed of the kingdom is the but word the of God. Seed. I'm sorry. Entirely different pair. Uh, I just thought. It... Uh, okay. Uh, 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 well, uh, Paul, uh, Paul, you finish up first, and then Michael, you go after right. Uh, what he just did was jump from one parable to another to try and get out of the force of the ejection I just raised. One is talking, talking about, about the same thing. Uh, no. Hold on, let, let Paul let Paul finish here. <sighs> Again, as I as I stated before. The, the essential argument of this has to be to produce a verse that says that the that the kingdom is this can exist in seed form. That is the word of God that hasn't been established. The parable that Michael is attempting to go to is another parable that talks about the size and the influence of the scope of the kingdom of God. That hasn't uh, in order to prove that assertion, you have to produce that verse. But I'm but um, I understand uh, I, I'm full and uh, I, I'm glad that there's um, some leeway being offered here that there's wanting to w walk back some of the claims of the churches of Christ, which incidentally are still being used today, by the way. It hasn't been abandoned, but I can go and find sermon after sermon um, from different churches of Christ and evangelists that tell me that there are certain marks of the church that I should be able to find. So if, if I can go on there and say and, and read their sermons that, um, that they've got to say that Christ is their founder, they've got to be called by a certain name, they have to uh, worship in a certain way, singing without instruments, praying, giving the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, the preaching or Bible teaching, and you have to adhere to your particular viewpoint on the, the, the plan of salvation. Where in church history did this group go? Uh, there's, there's no evidence that this uh, type of doctrine was taught. Even if you assume it was taught in the New Testament, there's no evidence that it existed anywhere in church history in the complete full format that you insist that has to be the case for salvation to occur until the time of the restoration movement. See, that's one thing I think is disingenuous about your position is that you won't come out and admit that you have to have all these things for salvation to occur. 
Yet these groups did not exist. And when we ask for proof, you won't give it. Okay. You guys can respond to that. Michael, do you want to respond? Oh, no. Go ahead. You guys keep on okay. trucking. Well, well, I, I, I would like to respond to briefly, but I want to move on to the next thing. Um, no, someone Travis, in the chat respond. says, Travis, what is your position? Would, would everyone raise your hand if you believe that the seed is the word of God? For sure. That is the word of God. Paul? I've already answered that question. I'm not playing your game. Oh, that's that's a that's a that's a good one, Desmond. You said on. you want to move on, Travis, but you're taking the slow route. I mean, go ahead and speak well, no, up. No, Desmond. No, uh, Paul Day just spoke for about two minutes. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Can, can we can we respond, JP? Go ahead. Go ahead. You go said ahead you wanted to speed it up. And I, and I want to answer some of his bad logical arguments. I mean, he's a Calvinist, so I don't yeah, even right. know why any of this matters. But go, anyway. Go ahead and respond to it. Okay. Uh, someone says, what's Travis's position? Here's our position. And when I do my show, if people call in and they want to bring up what some man wrote or if they want to bring up some personal attack on someone, I say, no, my program is about the Bible. Let's get back to the Bible. Paul Day wants to bring up what some man wrote. Now, we want to get back to the Bible. The seed is the word of God. And what I believe is if you obey what the Bible says and what they did in the first century, it makes you a Christian upon how to be saved and then how to worship. And that is basically the simple uh, lesson of the seed is the word of God. You do what the Bible says, it makes you a Christian. It doesn't make you a Catholic. It doesn't make you a Baptist. It doesn't make you a Pentecostal. If you do what the Bible says, it makes you a Christian. It doesn't make you a Calvinist. So I don't know why some people are Calvinists. You should want to be a Christian. And so well, now, can we move question, on? But hold on, that's begging the question. You can't just move on and you're begging the question. Right? Because if someone uh, identifies as like a Baptist, like, you know, I'm part of a Southern Baptist church. But I don't go around saying I'm a Baptist. I go around saying I'm a Christian. I, I, that's the same for J.P., Paul Day, and everyone else who goes by these denominations. You know, denomination doesn't mean someone just all of a sudden shed, sheds the name of Christ. Far from it. If you go to uh, the Baptist church, for example, that I go to, all they speak is the gospel. They speak about what the word of God said, what Jesus himself said. They don't speak about who... Whoever started the Baptist movement, they don't talk about him or who the founder is. They talk about Christ. So, you know, I mean, the logic of your argument there is just resting on the idea of these names. Okay, we go by the name of the Church of Christ. You guys go by uh, Baptist Church. Therefore, by, you know, by, you know, exclusion, you guys aren't the real church. That's a bad argument. You can't use it. No, you have to go. You, you have to hold on, hold on. You have to no, go based. You, you, you didn't have, hear let me, my let argument. Let me finish. Let me, let me because finish. the name I said, do what the Bible says. I get so that. I get around. that. I, no, I get that. I get that. You ain't. You're not hearing what I'm trying to tell you. You but went. To, you, 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 all right. You went on talking about. You know, they would come out Christian. They wouldn't come out as Catholic. They wouldn't come out as Calvinist. They wouldn't come out as Baptist. That's faulty. Again, we're not. We're, you're using denominations as opposed to what these people identify as. They identify themselves as Christians, regardless of denomination. You ask JP, Paul Day, or anyone else, it'll be the same. The, my point I'm, I'm trying to make to you is, if you're trying to say, well, you know, they can't come out as you know Calvinist or Baptist, or whatever, they had to come out as Christian. That is faulty because you have to go based on what they believe rather than the name that they bear. And, and what you said, Travis, answering Paul, you started out again with this seed of God argument, and then you ended with Calvinism, but you didn't deal with any of the things that Paul raised that you guys require for salvation. You just said, obey the whole Bible. And I mean, you didn't refute anything in particular. No, I think you guys actually need to clear out your, your ears because you're not listening. Okay. I said, what the Bible says to do to be saved, you must do that, and that makes you a Christian. And then what the Bible says upon how to worship God and how to live a moral life, you need to do that to be faithful. Okay, but he raised things in particular, like the musical instruments and the Lord's Supper and, and the things that you guys have implemented. He asked, where where is the evidence of that in church history? And and that hasn't been dealt with. And I'm so you didn't sure hear what, what I said. said. I said... Let's go back to the Bible. See, you want secular things. And, and see, that's why my program is about the Bible, just like Paul Day brought up. He brought up what some man wrote. And you guys are not interested in the Bible. So Trevor, let's still, go back still begging to the Bible. A, that's um, still begging the question, though, because, again, your movement has a starting point. The restoration movement let, let, started let with certain Paul people. Go ahead, go, yeah. ahead, go ahead, Paul Day. Let me, let, me, let me show something. I think anybody who's watching this can see 
that the Church of Christ has a stick that they use. They want to talk about our history to point out how we don't, quote unquote, start in the New Testament. But then when we apply the same standards to their own movement, suddenly we just want to talk about verses. We don't want to talk about history. This is an example of what would is verging on being a cultic movement. When you don't want to address the, 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 the issues in your church history. No, it, it, this is a serious matter because when you question me about my church history and I can't talk to you about your own church history, that tells me you're not interested in having a discussion. You're not interested in having a dialogue and you, you don't want peace. You want capitulation. You want us to all bow down and kiss your ring and join your church. Okay. So, Paul Day, where do you go to church? I've already given you that information. I'm not giving you that information so you can harass my preacher for the people okay. I go to church with. That's that's no, irrelevant. I, don't harass it. I just think you're ashamed of your church. No, that's no no. Hold on, hold on. Let's let's All get right, back to on, let's Travis. get back to the actual. There's no reason for that. Yeah, no let's get back to the that. actual uh, topic here because again, when we're talking about what you were mm -hmm. just saying, you mentioned the Baptist, Baptist church, you mentioned the Catholic church, you mentioned all this, and you say uh -huh. if you follow the Bible. <laughs> we will become Christian as opposed to these other groups right here. You're assuming that these groups are not Christian based on what? Based on your doctrine as opposed to like, you know, is this really what the Bible says? So now we have to get back into like the doctrines of your particular church as opposed to every, every other church. Is this really what the Bible teaches? We can get into the Baptist discussion if we want to, because again, that's an important one. We talked about Can we talk a little bit? bit? Yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. As a matter of fact, I was, was going to say, and then here you're I'll, talking for a minute. So, I mean, yeah, do we hold, get to hold on, Travis. So. Hold on, Travis. Let, I was going to say, let Michael. No, I know how it goes. Go. You guys are going to get to talk 10 minutes gonna, and we get to talk Travis, one minute. Travis, That's Travis, not right. I, Travis, I was going to say, let Michael and Shane get in here. If you guys okay. have any comments, that'd be great. I was going to say, in regards to, you know, we go by the authority of. The word of God, that's where we're going to find the evidence on what we're supposed to do uh, in order to worship God and be pleasing unto him. Now, is there secondary information out there that y'all are asking for with regards to, uh, you know, like, for example, partaking of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? And I would I would say that, that yes, there is some historical information out there. Justin Martyr, the Didache. And others, other texts. Uh, but where where do they meet all those conditions? That's what we asked. That it takes all of them for salvation. Where do they all meet them? Well, I mean, I can't help if they don't give all the. I mean, all the historical information doesn't give all that stuff. I mean, it's just it's going to be found in the Bible. Okay, so let me ask you this, JP. How does one become a Jehovah Witness? <laughs> oh my gosh, Travis! <laughs> Why do you think it's oh funny? So when my. we laugh, it's not, it's not, it's not cool. Or okay, we're being hey, rude, Travis, you Travis, laugh. this has been a good discussion. Just calm down. You just asked to allow your friends to speak. It was Shane's turn, and then Michael was supposed to go next, and then you hit me with a Jehovah Witness question. Let, okay, let go ahead, Michael. Oh, nothing. I was just going to, I mean, I was just sitting here thinking that, um, you know, our acts of worship, uh, it goes along with, it's, uh, it's totally based on scripture. I mean, you can't find anywhere in the New Testament where it says to play. Everything is to sing. Ephesians 5, 19, speak, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Yeah, I mean, Paul, that's just... I know Paul is more familiar with it. You want to respond to that? Uh, once again, this this is another example. We have asked a question. We are not getting an answer to the question. They want to diverge the conversation into something else. Yes, we know that the Church of Christ has a particular interpretations of Ephesians 5, 18, 19, and 20. And uh, the, the verses there on the, the singing and such. I can What's also the question? You said we're diverting. I'm just wondering what is was the question again. Well, he brought up instruments. <sighs> okay, um, uh, we know that you have a particular interpretation of that particular verse, speaking in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. We can go back in church history and find that others took an entirely different approach to that issue. 
there was a certain point in church history where the argument was we don't use instruments in music because that's what we we've never done. We there was not a scriptural argument for it until several uh, centuries down the road. This is a, a particular argument that's been borrowed from a particular section in church history to, to try and show that you're you're somehow in step with church history. Then, then again, at the same time, you won't provide the evidence for the rest of it. Uh, it's just another example of inconsistent standards. So, so I mean, go ahead. well, I mean, uh, Paul, I think you're, do you not think you're asking too much of me to... <laughs> That I have to find, uh, I don't know how you want to say it. I guess, um, I mean, do, do we have to find, why, why do we have to find this in, in church history? The, you know, why can't we just look at what the Bible says? Amen. I mean, I think he's looking for a scroll or something. I mean, just to give the example of the organization of the church. So, I mean, let's just talk about that. Uh, I don't know how, how are you all, how is your organization set up? I'm just kind of curious real quick. I mean, do you have, do you have a plurality of elders? Do you have a plur? I mean, what? Uh, my church personally does. We have uh, a past and we have uh, other elders there as well, but um, there's, I mean, there's, it, it, there's other churches that don't, uh, but again, if those that don't, let's just, you know, uh, there's churches that only have one pastor. Are you saying those are not legit churches or how do you do that? Well, uh, you know, here's, I mean, I would say that we would need to, we got to follow the pattern. Uh, and you know that there is the qualifications that people have to, that Christian men have to meet. Ephesians chapter two and three, yeah. Uh, uh, well, I was thinking of well, three. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so even, even in churches of Christ, uh, Travis and Michael know this, that there are a lot of congregations that don't have elders. Um, I mean, because there are no men that are qualified yet to meet those. I, I pray that, you know, there would be men who would be groomed to meet those qualifications. But, but you see what I'm saying? That we are to follow that pattern. Now, if I were to go to, you know, uh, a church that had a, I call it the one man pastor system. Uh, that's not biblical. That's not according to the pattern. And would you? Right, I, have a, I have a question oh, about the the instruments before we get into elders and how churches are set up. Paul seemed to bring up an argument that Church of Christ has not always used a scriptural defense for musical instruments. Is that true? Yeah, I don't think it was uh, actually brought into like 600, um, the year 600 or something like that before they started trying to implement instruments. Okay, but your all's position is that if a church worships with instruments, then their worship is in vain. So therefore their salvation, uh, they're disqualified. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so a person can hear, believe, repent, be water baptized, but if they are in a church with instruments, they're disqualified. Well, well on top of that, JP, some people believe that if you believe that the, the church only existed in seed form, you would actually burn in hell. So your well, let's, argument let's, let's about think, okay. worship let's stick to, let's God, stick to the topic. Let's, let's stick okay. to the question. This is to made the that point clear. Can, can I, right, can I make a point? Go ahead. Can go I, ahead. I mean, go ahead. all right, so... So Michael presented that if you are worshiping in vain worship, okay, is that being pleasing to God? Can you, can you worship in vain and, and be okay with God, JP? Now, let me, let me make this clear. He said that this was not instilled until 600 AD. They, did, they didn't figure this Somewhere. out until 600 AD. So, no, I think so we, I think I'm not exactly for sure on that, but I think it's somewhere around the year 600 or right in that range is when they started uh, trying to implement the first uh, instrument in in church services. So so it's salvific, but nobody knew about the salvation implications before 600 A.D. 
No, the, the question I ask is, can you worship God in vain, JP, and go to heaven? Can you have vain worship? And you keep, you talk about me dodging the question. It's a simple question, man. Why don't you answer I asked, it? okay, I asked a question yeah. first before you asked your question. And, and my question, it. I'm trying to clarify his point. Yeah. yeah uh, okay, no, you've established, you've time. established that musical instruments was imp implemented in 600 A.D., so I I'm was saying the wrong oh, yeah. range. Okay, bring that up, Desmond, about the Patriot preacher. And yeah, the, if uh, I remember, yeah, well, hold on. Patriot, whoever. Um, I think he's. I think it was. It was implemented for a little time in 600 AD, but then it went away. But then a thousand, like he's saying, it was. Yeah, I wasn't away. exactly sure on the year. I just knew that someone tried to implement it, and it, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be my struggle with the, the whole scenario here of making musical instruments a requirement for salvation or, or the, you know, the lack thereof. You're saying that nobody knew these salvation implications until between 600 and 1000 A.D. So people could have been playing the harp in worship, thinking they're saved and going to heaven, but they're really not. And this is just some new information that comes way later after the Bible is complete. That just seems very odd to me. There might be somebody can explain that. So better. so do you so back to the question, would you answer that, JP? Can you worship in vain and get to go to heaven? Can you have vain worship? Travis, I do not believe somebody's disqualified from their salvation because they're playing a harp in church. That's not what I ask. I, I ask that, can you worship that's my in vain? Answer. That's my answer. What about because, you, Desmond? You you won't be afraid to answer it, Desmond. Can you worship in vain, be pleasing to God, and go to heaven worshiping in vain worship? If your definition of worshiping in vain is by playing instruments in church, then I would say no, they would still go to heaven. Uh, their salvation I'm not, is I'm not, not, I'm not, I'm not, it, 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 I'm not because, explaining what it is. I'm just asking in war, vain I get, worship. I get, I get it. I get it. Yeah, because when okay. I say vain, when I say vain worship, I'm thinking of someone whose heart is far from the Lord. Someone who is, you know, saying, oh, I love Jesus, you know, I believe in Christ and all that, I'm a Christian, and yet their hearts are far from it. They can sing all the praises, but yet they're not, they don't believe in God. So, no, that person would not go to heaven because their worship is not truly in, in, in God at all. They never believe in God. But if your definition of being worship is, is dependent on someone playing instruments, I would say that person will still go to heaven regardless if they play a harp or not. The instruments don't make no difference in someone's uh, salvation. So it, it just depends what you mean by being worship. Okay, this, this is what I mean uh, right here. I'll bring up what the Bible says on vain worship. Can you share it? Uh, Actually, that's, that's, the, that's the video I want to get back to maybe here in, here in a second. It's probably my wife telling me to be quiet. So, right here. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So, Jesus is saying that vain worship consists also with teaching the doctrines, commandments of men. Would mm -hmm. you agree with that? Of course. Okay. So, so in other words, JP, how about this? In authority, how many sources of authority in the Bible is there? God is the authority. God. All right. But now also the Bible teaches that there's another authority that we should not follow. And what is that authority from? Yeah, our, mm, that we should not follow. I mean, yeah, how we much should follow. Of, yeah, but there is no other authority. You can't say one has authority and then another has authority. There's only one authority, which is God. I'm not going to say Satan has authority. And, and I recognize vain worship exists, Travis, but we... We all have a different idea of what vain worship that disqualifies our salvation is. Okay. I recognize all kinds of heretical churches, but like I said, I'm not going to disqualify someone's salvation. I'm not going to tell them they're not saved because they're playing a harp in church. Well, well, one one thing, it doesn't matter really about what you think, JP, or even me. It, it matters what the Bible says, right? Well, right, so, and we're looking at the Bible. So you reference Matthew 15. What is the uh, vain worship that they're uh, doing there in that verse? What what okay. what's he bringing up? Is he bringing well, he up says, harps? Is he bringing up harps in the church? Well, he says teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So these these Jews are bringing in 
uh, secular tradition, what man has come along with later, and they're teaching this and they're binding this. So the principle would still apply in the New Testament. If your preacher come along and made some other commandment and you guys are worshiping by it, it's vain worship. So give me an example. That's extremely but, vague. And, and yeah, instruments you have to give in the an church example. are not a commandment. Okay, okay. here, here, here hmm. is uh, an example. Today, uh, let's say when we, when we go assemble and we worship for the Lord's Supper that they did in the New Testament, we, we had pizza and Dr. Pepper. Would that be okay? No, it's not okay. Because it would be a commandment of man, right? Just, if just like says, you don't, you don't come in under the influence to take the Lord's Supper. The Scripture's clear about that too. That's, that's oh, that would a be a great good example. example. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can have Bud Light and smoke well, cigars for the Lord's Supper. I, I should right. mention back. I should well, mention I back. In, I should mention back in the early church they had something that was called a. It was like a feast, so it wasn't just a cracker and juice. They had an entire feast. So it wasn't just the bread and the wine, but they also had lots of other food as well. Uh, they stopped doing it after a while because of uh, there was persecution. Uh, so if we're looking at what the Bible actually commanded as far as what they did, they actually had an entire supper, not just uh, crackers and, and juice. So do you guys have more than just crackers and juice in your church? Well, uh, they can answer this, but for the viewers in the chat, uh, someone says, I heard enough from Travis. He's so lost. Well, I do a live call-in program, Rob, on Fridays, and if you want to call in, I would love to hear from you, and I'll let you speak, and we can bring up the Bible up on the screen. So I just wanted to share that. Let them answer about the Lord's Supper. Yeah, just just really quick as well. It's called a, a love or agape feast. That's what you used to call it back in the day. You can find yeah. that back in Acts chapter two, verse forty-six uh, to forty-seven. Also, First Corinthians chapter eleven, seventeen to thirty-four. They talk about the uh, the love feast. So, is that something that your church uh, actually does, or is it just like the watered down uh, version that the churches do today, including my own church, just the crackers and juice? So yeah. because, okay. because if, if we're if we're going back to what the Bible says, because I, I mean that's that's been you know pretty big here, and we have to be explicit what the Bible says, well the Bible defines what that feast was back in the day, and we have historical records of what that feast was. So are we do we actually have a feast when we're doing the Lord's Supper or we're we just doing crackers and juice? Just uh for the vine and the, uh the crackers and unleavened bread. Right. That's, that's but see, JP, what, what I was wanting to say something, if you don't mind. When yeah, JP yeah. there uh, just a second ago, he he acknowledged how how ridiculous that sounded, like of uh, you know eating pizza or whatever for the Lord's Supper. But that same logic applies whenever I think of uh, using instruments in church, because in the New yep. Testament, like I'm saying, it that that's the same type of logic that you were using there. It makes perfect sense to me why I wouldn't use a a harp or a piano in church, but that sounded ridiculous to you, but that's kind of the way it sounds to me when you guys say that you want to use a harp or something in church. Well, we, it, we've acknowledged, we've acknowledged that vain worship exists, but our position is that playing a harp in church is not an example of vain worship. What is an example then JP? Give us an example. You know, I'm sorry, but there's nowhere in the scriptures that you're going to be able to pull out a verse and say, look, it's right here. If you use a harp in church, your salvation's disqualified. Okay. Because what is an you're example? You're not going to find it. I gave you an example. Somebody coming in intoxicated, taking the Lord's supper. We have that in scripture. It mentions yeah. that in Corinthians, right? And also, and also the uh, circumcision as well, because we're talking about the commandments of men. Jesus is directly talking about the Pharisees in that context, and the Pharisees were trying to push the law, saying the Christians have to uphold that. So we jump forward over to Galatians. We see the Judaizers trying to make the, the, the Galatian people uh, get circumcised. And so this will, be a, this will be a commandment of men as opposed to God. God didn't tell the church to get circumcised. Uh, but as far as like instruments and that sort of thing, we don't see that in scripture saying you cannot play a harp in church or you can't play the piano or you can't well, even have I'm, pizza. Well, I'm actually glad that it doesn't clarify and say everything that we're not allowed to do. Because if that were the case, then we wouldn't have enough books in the world. <laughs> yep. uh, I, I would agree with that to an extent. But yet again, if we're, if we're saying we can't play instruments because that's band worship. Again, that's not in scripture. Well, like, where do we get the indication? Well, um, okay. it doesn't say not to go to church drunk either, does it? It actually does. It says you have to be sober. 
Yeah, as a Christian, we should be we should all be sober. Uh, you know, every you know that's part of the, of the spirit. You know, First uh, Peter chapter three, I believe, it says we should be sober minded. Uh, all throughout Scripture tells us to be sober, so that's consistent. But as far as like again playing instruments within the congregation of the church, we don't see that. Like, is that wrong or right? It doesn't say that. Okay. So, let me, so let me, let's clarify okay. something if I might. Why why did they use musical instruments in the Old Testament? No, I'll turn that down. Oh yeah, I hear something back there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking. I mean, why why did they use musical instruments in the Old Testament? I think of David and the Psalms. I mean, I'm not you know a, a musical saying. instrument expert in in the Old Testament, but can you use that worship to the Lord? Travis, can you bring up Second Chronicles 29? Let's pull it up real quick. If you don't have it, I can pull it up really quick. That's fine. Whoever, whoever wants to pull it up. Uh, you said Second Chronicles what? 29. Uh -huh. well, I, I'd like to, if you guys could clear up that issue of the one cup situation, mm -hmm. everybody drinking out of the same cup, or, or what's going on with that. I didn't experience that when I was <laughs> at Church of Christ. Yeah. And, and yeah. I don't know if that, I don't know if that actually is a rumor or what, What's the story behind that? But I'd like to hear the truth on that. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. Okay. Um, verse 26. I think it's oh, somewhere on there. Uh, I keep typing it in wrong. Uh, there we go. Yeah. So you see there, uh, verse, sorry, verse 25. You want, you want to read that, Travis? Or? And he stationed... Go ahead, sorry. You got it. And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and with stringed instruments and with harps, according to the commandment of David, of, the, of Gad the kings of Seir and of Nathan the prophet, for thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. So why why was it done? That was the commandment of the Lord. Commandment yeah. of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you would agree that we're under the new covenant today. Agreed? All right. Mm -hmm. Is there any such commandment given about using mechanical instruments of music? No, there's no, no. There's, no, there's no commandment against it either. Well, that's where we talk about the silence of the scriptures. I think that's be an important principle. But we can talk about that later if that'd be... Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so JP, with regards to the one cup issue, um, it let's go to Matthew twenty six twenty eight. Um, Travis, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, and 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 see, Desmond, we view as silence of the scriptures doesn't give authority for us to do things. Well, we'll we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. I just want to give an answer. So um, there are some congregations that do have just one container. And they say that, you know, it's verse 27. Uh, then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. Um, so the, they would say, see, you have to have one container. But, you know, it comes from a misunderstanding of that this is a figure of speech it's it's what's called metonymy where something represents if i were to ask you the question have you ever read aristotle well what do i mean by that i mean have you ever read his writings have you ever read his book and we find this figure of speech used a lot in the in the new testament and this would be one of those examples and it's just sadly an abuse that people think that you have to use a container and i i actually do uh, fellowship these brethren, huh. but unfortunately, they bind it. Sometimes they bind it on others, and it's unfortunate. So that group would not have fellowship with the churches that actually use multiple cups. That that is now there. There might be some that do. I don't know. I mean, there's. Uh, I don't, I don't okay. know. Okay. Um. So. You mind if I just talk about the silence of the scriptures for a moment? Is that be okay? 
Uh, yeah, I think one, one of the principles that I think is taught is Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. If you don't mind going there. Yeah. I keep turning it in my Bible, but I forget. Uh, Hebrews what, Shane? 7, 14. And while you guys are doing that, I just want to mention... Um, Michael, if you uh, you can unmute yourself whenever. I just muted you for a moment, so I heard a lot of noise in the background. Yeah, I had to change rooms on you. Sorry. Um, so I think we all know the context here, talking about how Jesus would be the priest after the order of Melchizedek. And we know that Melchizedek was king and priest of Salem. So Jesus, he comes after the order of that, that he would simultaneously serve as both king and priest on the throne, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 6, 12 and 13. And so the Hebrews writer says, um, talking about that, for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Um, so you see there, I mean, it is the case that Moses spoke nothing. There was silence about that in the old covenant, you see how through the law of Moses, God commanded that it was the Levites to, you know, officiate in the priesthood. And we do find an example where um, I think about Uzziah. I think it's Second Chronicles 26, if I remember, where I guess go ahead and go there. Second Chronicles 26. Yeah, I mean, you don't even have to convince me. I've always applied to my life that if I don't have scriptural support for something, I'm I'm not going to teach it and preach it. Um, I mean, that's, you know, where the Bible is silent, we are silent. I think everybody should adhere to that. I mean, I, I don't need much convincing. I don't need convincing on that. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just trying to show why we believe what we believe. Um, verse 16, I think it is. Go down. Oh, yeah. Um, so it says, uh, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord, but his God, by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Um, so Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him were 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men, and they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, Listen, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. And we know that he sinned against God, and he he was punished by becoming a leper. And so, I mean, God just has to say what he wants. And, you know, he, he's silent about it. And therefore, we see that there's the prohibition there in that, Uzziah, he tried to go and offer incense, and he he shouldn't have done that. I mean, is that am I making sense here, or am I? Yeah, let me let me pull up another verse, but someone can talk as I pull it up. Someone else can read it. And I, sorry, my computer had just frozen. So if you can summarize me really quick, uh, what you were saying there. Well, that God commanded under, under the old covenant, we see is the case that. God wanted the priesthood to be uh, officiated by the Levite, by the tribe of Levi. Mm -hmm. right. He didn't. He didn't have to go around saying, "Okay, uh, Simeon, uh, Judah." Uh, you know, right, he didn't right. have to go <laughs> 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 to the tribes mm. because it, it stands clear that, like we learned from this principle, that God is. If God is silent, then it is prohibitory. So oh, read that verse. And you, uh, well, really quick, uh, you, you said you're basing that off this scripture here, First Corinthians four six. Is that right? Well, no, he based it off of Hebrews seven fourteen, 7, and then 14. the Old Testament example. But this one would go along with teaching. Hey, well, sorry about that. My computer had just froze. So I just missed uh, oh. most of what you just said there. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just looking it over again. So it says, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. So I don't see a problem with doing what the Bible says and not adding to it. 
Right, and tying yeah. that back along with Ephesians 5.19 where it says only to sing. It says singing. And I was also curious uh, with you guys. Now, if you if you use the instruments in church, now, wouldn't everybody that attends there have to be playing the instrument? No. No? There's no, there's no commandment on any of that. So that, that's what I'm saying. Uh, when it comes to that, I mean... So, I, what, just, so, sorry there, Desmond, but what, so wouldn't you say you would be adding to... No, if I said that God commanded that, uh, that we should do this, then I'll be adding to the scriptures. I'm not saying God said this or not. All I'm saying is that God said we should worship him. That's okay. it. I'm not, well, I'm, not, just... I'm not stating that God gave a guideline. Of, okay, this is how you should do things. You should not practice or, or you should practice with instruments. God doesn't say either one, so it's not my place to say what God said or not. If okay. God doesn't say it, then we can, there's liberty there. That's what I believe. What, well, I'm just kind of curious on Paul Day. What, what is your position? Are you... Uh, are you fine with instruments or not? I'm just curious because you've kind of been quiet for a while, too. I've just been uh, listening to the, to the back and forth and uh, just trying to think of the, the best way to approach this. Uh, the, the whole conversation seemed to center around um, the, the, the quote from Jesus that in vain they, they do worship me, teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. One thing I did not hear dis discussed at all is that Jesus was directly quoting from the Old Testament there in Isaiah 29 and verse 13. And yes, there is a scriptural standard as to what is considered vain worship. And the prophet Isaiah identified what that was. He said, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are from me. So that was the issue. The Judaism had reduced itself to uh, commandments by rote. And even then, in that time, since it was taken up as something traditional done among the people, they had the same issue that was going on in Jesus's day. They were adding in also whatever they wanted. The, the, the main condemnation of the prophet was their heart was not in the worship. That was the, the condemnation. They were treating the worship of Yahweh as something as it was done to a tribal deity, done as something that was inherited from their forefathers. And God was after true worship, not just in the New Testament that Jesus talked about. He was after it even then within the confines of the Old Covenant. So all this focusing on... Uh, rules uh made up uh it can be a cop out to to say anything that i disagree with is therefore the commandments of men therefore your your worship is in vain no isaiah defined what vain worship was and it had to do whether or not you that you're that you were worshiping from the heart now as for the argument that was brought up about uh how uh, silence doesn't uh, give permission um I can't help but think of uh, the, with the example that was cited from Hebrews about uh, the tribe that Moses spoke nothing about. And they assume the, the assumption was here that Moses said that the Levites were to take care of these issues and God said nothing of the kind uh, other than that. And therefore, they were to infer that nobody but the Levites could be involved in the worship. Yet I read in Numbers 18 in verse 7 that uh, the commandment of Yahweh was this, and I quote, but only you and your sons shall attend to your priesthood for everything concerning the altar and what is inside the veil, and you are to perform that service. I am giving you the work of the priesthood as a gift, but any outsider who comes near the sanctuary must be put to death. Now, that doesn't sound like the argument we just heard a while ago. It was already exclusive from the beginning. So that exclusivity should be brought into the discussion about what is being discussed in the book of Hebrews. The law had made it clear in no uncertain terms that no one but the tribe of Levi was to maintain the priesthood. And it, it made that clear that there was no uh, argument from silence or anything of the kind. It excluded everyone but Levi and Aaron and his sons. And as far as uh, silence goes, I don't even think Jesus would agree with this standard because when he was discussing the nature of the Sabbath in Matthew verse 12, when he was quoting the issue about the story about Abiathar and David when he was running from Saul, he, uh, he recounts the episode and he said that David entered the house of God. He and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to eat, but only for the priest. And he went on to say that the, that the Levites uh, in verse 5, according to the law on the Sabbath, they uh, when they do their work, they're quote-unquote breaking the Sabbath. 
the issue was here, the silence of the scriptures within the narrative about David and Abiathar, Jesus showed that silence was permission. So I don't think the scriptures maintain this hermeneutic that was just presented in all three cases I've cited. So, okay. I mean, so, so with that, uh, can I ask you a question, Desmond? Uh, yeah. Then after I want to go back to uh, First Corinthians uh, four as well, but go ahead. Well, can you bring up what was put up there too? See, this is this is another this is another example of how we first started the show. Uh, no, 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 not my screen. Uh, the oh. comment about oh, victory. I victory put something. Yeah, I see it. Hold on one second there. Okay. See, see, guys, this is the prime example of what I just stated. Don't some churches of Christ sound a trumpet to start their services? See, have you ever heard of that? <laughs> no. And so well, what I'm getting at is what, when people start saying, I heard this, or, hey, what about this? I heard this. That's basically a tailbearer. It's a gossiper. And then I'm trying to teach people what the churches of Christ and the Bible believe, and no one sounded a trumpet. See, see I want your viewers to understand <clears throat> that I want to go back to the Bible and do Let's, the things in the Bible. That's mischaracterizing what he was asking. Though. He was actually asking a legit question. He wasn't sure. He wasn't trying to uh, gossip or anything like that. Otherwise, he said, well, I heard this. No, he asked you a question. He said, don't, church okay. of the Christ, don't sound, you know, uh, sound a tr trumpet. He was just a legit question. Don't have okay, to mischaracterize well, Aaron there. Well, that, well, that was what, wanting to definitely answer that because if maybe if I didn't get to answer that, people in the chat room would start hearing we have special water and special trumpets now. Well, I'm just saying, though, it's important not to mischaracterize someone's question. If someone's asking a question within the comments, you know, you don't have to do like, you know, do all the extra. Just say, well, no, we don't do that. Okay. You know, Can, I, I want to share, uh, I want you to share this and listen to this just for a second on the video. And I actually agree with some of it. Uh, your screen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can barely hear it. Um, uh, the, the one thing that I always, when, when I'm having these, is that better? About church That's about Christ, about baptism. From 2008 to 2010, I had an absolute, unbelievable, awesome experience in Church of Christ. I had no idea that they believed differently. I wanted a small church. The pastor there took me and my wife into his home, studied with me, always there for questions, helped my wife out tremendously. Like, I have no reason to bash Church of Christ. Now, the version of Church of Christ that Travis and Anthony and the Robertsons the, the stuff that they put out on YouTube and, and the way they go about things, I can't support that at all. My, my preacher back then was nothing like that whatsoever. Uh, I got, me and my wife got baptized in the Gulf of Mexico, and I didn't get baptized in the Church of Christ. And a lot of churches of Christ prefer you to get water baptized in their church. My pastor was fine with it. Uh, we never butted heads. Uh, and, and AK has been an awesome friend to me over the last couple of years. He's always respectable. He's nothing like those other guys. I met a, another Church of Christ preacher from. Thanks, JP. I just wanted to stop right there, but let's keep going. Um, Alabama, and I've studied with him a little bit. He's nothing like these other guys. Um, and, and we've heard from AK. He's not dogmatic about the musical instruments and some of these secondary doctrines where where some of the churches of Christ are just like, no, we're not having that. We're not fellowshipping with you if, you know, you break out a fluke in the church or something. You know, it's just not that dogmatic. Um, so I always try to be real respectable with them. And I do appreciate them because, you know, when it comes to Sola Scriptura, if it's not in the Bible, they're not messing with it. Like, they don't adhere to any creeds, church fathers, like, it's chapter and verse or get it away from me. And I okay, so 
So that's just what I wanted to play that I do appreciate that last part. So I wanted the viewers to, to have that mindset that if anything else is said later, if you do reviews like your review you did, Desmond, of Don Blackwell, I have no problem with that. But when people come on and say, well, what do they believe about this? I want you to think about JP, whatever the Bible says. So if you really want to know what the churches of Christ believe, just go to your New Testament and see what they did. Okay, so let me let me let me do this as well, um, because uh, we were, I was going to go over to First Corinthians chapter four verse. I think you read verse six. Uh, I didn't I didn't want to let this slide here because I thought it was important to go over this really quick. And I thought Paul Day did a good job as far as like explaining his side of things as well. Um, when he started elaborating that scripture, I just want to elaborate on this as well here. Let me share my screen on this and go oh, back. Oh, and while you're doing that, this is a quick question I, uh, I was, was want to ask you, Desmond. Do mm -hmm. you believe in sprinkling? Uh, sprinkling? Yeah. Uh, me personally, if you're going to be baptized, I believe you have to be immersed. So okay. that's just exactly how that word is uh, translated. What about you, JP? Before you go into great detail, do you, do you believe that sprinkling is okay or does it matter? No, no, absolutely not. Baptism is full immersion like John the Baptist did it. Okay. And, and the reason why y'all would hold that view is why? Because of what the word says. What the Bible says. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So, so if I were to say the Bible doesn't say not to, what's your response? I mean, I, I'm not saying I hold that view. Wait, what? Right, right. The Bible says not to say not to. What? The Bible I, I, says not to sprinkle. Yeah, I, I get what he's asking. So, you know, he can come up and say, well, the Bible doesn't if say it's it. So you're trying to make the point if there's not something in the Bible, why accept it? And it's kind of reverted back to this instrument thing. See, it's one thing if you guys say, OK, you know what? We don't think instruments in the church is biblical. And if your church chooses not to have instruments, That's when right. I first noticed that, when I went in there, I'm like, where's where's the choir? Where's the instruments? And, and they were all reading hymns. I'm like, wow, this is new to me and I can't sing. I'm terrible. So I'm like just barely <laughs> whispering. And I'm like, I, you know, it's a little bit awkward, but hey, if this is what they choose to do, it's kind of old fashioned. Hey, I'll do it. If you guys actually just took the stance that, hey, we prefer not to use instruments because we don't see strong evidence for that in the Bible, that's, that's one thing. But when you say, well, these other churches that are using instruments – we're not going to have fellowship with them. They're worshiping in vain. Um, we're going to disqualify them as saved Christians. I, that's just taking it way too far. Um, if I get to heaven and God says, you know what? I really didn't want those instruments used in my church. Hey, you know, okay, what? I was wrong. Sorry. But to disqualify Christians. And, and when you go to Matthew 15 and it says their hearts are far from me, my brothers and sisters in my church, uh, their hearts are not far from the Lord just in, because they have instruments in the church and, and their worship should be considered vain. I'm sorry. It's just it's taking it way too far. What, what, it's, well, it's, what it's, about it's, Shane? He did ask you a question. Oh, uh, will you present the question again, Shane? Well, why? Why wouldn't you sprinkle? I mean, if why? I mean, you're saying that you accept that baptism, the true mode of baptism is immersion, but you would say, well, with regards to sprinkling, but it's not found in the scriptures. I mean, it's not found. Because you know? I'm also not seeing that God is communicating to us that our salvation is null and void if we use instruments in the church. It's the exact same principle that I don't accept infant baptism and I don't go around telling people their worship is in vain if they have a harp in the church because I'm not seeing that from the scriptures. It's the exact same principle. Right. And as far as I'm concerned with the baptism uh, part, I don't think that really relates only because we look at baptism and the word it, and what it means in Greek. It means to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, uh, to cleanse by dipping and submerging. You don't see uh, a sprinkling. And historically, you don't see that as well. So that's why I base my um, my opinion on it. Uh, so when we look at the Bible, that's how uh, baptism is shown. Now, mm -hmm. again, when it comes to instruments, you just don't see any indication where God condemns that within the church. He doesn't condemn sprinkling either. 
I didn't say that, but what I'm saying is that how he uh, defines baptism is shown in the Bible, so that's why I have to go by. I'm not condemning anybody. Like, let's just say someone gets sprinkled. I'll leave that between them and the Lord. Again, that's not a salvific issue for me. I know that's, that is for you. Uh, baptism in and of itself, you already know, we had this debate before. I don't think water baptism is necessary for salvation. So whether it happens or not is irrelevant to me. Um, again, when it comes to baptism, if, if you are going to get baptized, you have to be immersed just based on how, you know, historically it's done, how it's shown in the Bible. Um, I, I want to answer answers from the AV. Can you put up that comment? Uh, the last one? There is not a command to immerse. That's simply false. Repent and be baptized. That is, those are two commands. So, sorry. Actually, 10, Acts 10 48 actually says he commanded them to be baptized. Acts 10 48. So, it is a command. So, all right. I'm sorry. And it's, I mean, we can we can actually go into that because I think that's probably like the biggest thing when we talk about Church of Christ. Obviously, water baptism is going to be like the number one thing. I mean, <laughs> even on the uh, Church of Christ website that I just went on here, they said that's probably like the ma major distinction between them and every other church out there. Okay. Uh, hey, no. since you want to do that, right, Desmond? You want to talk about that? Can we can we watch a part of this? This actually goes into baptism. Sure, and just just because this is a special episode, I'll let this go on for another thirty minutes. <laughs> I'll give okay. us more time. Let me ask something yeah. real quick about the sprinkling and the infant baptism, real quick. Um, when when Jesus was taken uh, after he was born after seven days, is is there some kind of truth there about? And maybe it goes back to the circumcision process in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Some churches will say, "Well, we sprinkle as." because we are dedicating the baby to the Lord. You know, some, some will say it's like a dedication, but it's not infant baptism because, you know, they need to be washed because of inherited sin or something. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things going on there, right? When we bring well, up that topic. I always associated that with a, a born in sin issues. Usually that's why you, find them baptizing babies or sprinkling babies is because they ultimately believe you're born into sin. Right. I, I, right. So some people do it for that reason. And there's other churches that'll say, well, we're not actually baptizing the infant. We're just dedicating the infant to the Lord. Right. I've there may that. be, there may be, I'm not sure. Yeah, on that. Yeah. I've heard that from, uh, from churches. Okay. You, you weren't ready to share that. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Answers from the AV, the mode of baptism given by vows by immersion, there is no command to immerse. That's simply false. <laughs> the imperative oh, who is there. that, Desmond? Is that's that Tanner? That's Tanner, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you know what? We we can have that. I can set that discussion up. That's uh, you know, he's he's a good friend of my uh, brother of mine. So if you guys want to have the discussion here, I, I went my hosting that. Oh, I'm fine. I have my own channel. He can call in anytime. I'd love to have him call in. He was supposed to several times, but uh, uh, I'm going to play this if that's okay. And then Shane, if you want to get that little, it's a, only like one or two slides and get that presentation about works. And then I think that would be good to, to go for with this. This is still pretty low. Well, hmm. then I have to do something. I have to work. That work earns or merits my salvation. You know, Christ, and I use Ephesians of course, chapter 2, verse 5, of course, uh, 8 through 10 as well. The good works comes after uh, your salvation, not before, not during. It comes right after that. Okay, so, so um, let me stop sharing. So what, what I wanted to just, when well, you wanted to talk about baptism, and you mentioned right there, you mentioned baptism, and you also mentioned Ephesians 2, and you mentioned good works. Now, uh, Shane, do you want to bring that in? Yeah, I'll, I'll bring it If in. he'll share it. Sure. Uh, I don't know. I was just about to pull it up. All right. Um. Desmond, would you mind reading that? And I mean, we can read Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 again, if that'd be helpful. I'd, I'd love to read that. 
Okay, I was about to say, because I'm pretty sure everyone heard that verse. I don't know how many times in this channel. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we can right. definitely do that. I'll just read this first, and, we, and then uh, we can go to Ephesians. Major premise. It says, all works of human merit are works that which cannot save, which is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Minor premise. Water immersion is a work of human merit. Conclusion, therefore, uh, water immersion is a work that cannot save. Would now... Would we all agree with the? I just want to ask everybody: Do you all agree with the major premise that that's true? Because I do. Yeah. All works of human merit are works which cannot save. True. Okay. Now, this is going to be for. JP, do you agree? I'm sorry. Do I agree with all three of these statements? No. Is that what he's saying? First one. I'm just saying the major premise. We're just looking at the major premise. <laughs> You're right. Oh, okay. All works of human merit. Well, yeah. yeah, absolutely. What about you, Paul? You already know he do. <laughs> well, I didn't see him say nothing, so I just wanted to make sure he was involved. I didn't want to leave him out. So I what? accept the premise in as much as it identifies with the meaning that's given in the New Testament. Okay. So would... Would you all agree? Now, this is where y'all are going to agree, and we're going to disagree. But do you believe water immersion is a work of human merit? Yes. Yeah. No. Based, on, based on First Peter chapter three, verse four, one of the whole verse. I think it's a work of God. Okay. Let's let me okay. bring in the okay. Bible. Then he referenced. Okay. I'm sorry. Who who said what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, no, no. I, I said I, I believe it is a human merit based on First Peter chapter three verse twenty one. The entire verse, because I, me and uh, Travis went over this before. Uh, there was a part of it where it says baptize, baptism now now saves you, and he just stops there. But if you read the entire verse, it actually says that it does not remove fle uh, dirt from flesh, which, re which refers to sin coming from the flesh, but it's actually an answer uh, to God for a good conscience. Yeah. And I think JP asked a really good question back in the open discussion. I would like to bring that back up here is that, you know, how do you get that uh, good conscience uh, prior to? Is that is that how it went along, JP? Yeah, yeah. It's can, the can, King James translation, I think, points can, can that out. Yeah. Would you mind bringing up First Peter 3, 2021? Yep, I'm just pulling it up right now. Bear for one second here. Because I, I want to ask, I want to ask a question about this. Uh, I, I'm just curious, Desmond. Um, did you watch uh, uh, this one video a while back? Um, and um, uh, are you familiar with GBN, uh, Don Blackwell, and uh, TBN? G GBN Gospel Bra Broadcasting Network. Oh, I was about to say TBN. Oh, yeah, that's a horror. <laughs> but yeah, I've heard, of, I've heard of GBN. Yeah. Okay, so they they reviewed a video um, of some guys out in North Carolina, mm -hmm. um, and they and they they brought up First Peter three twenty twenty one, and uh, I want to ask you if they're if if you're making the same argument that they were making. So you're saying uh, in verse twenty one, there's also also an antitype which now saves us baptism. Now let me let me ask let me ask this real quick because of the context. Do you agree that this is water baptism? Yeah, it's talking about water baptism being the same. Yeah, I mean, verse 20, uh, obviously. Yeah. So, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, the the word there, flesh, you, you're saying that that's sin? Is that what I understand? Yes. Exactly. Okay. Whenever, whenever it's talking about the flesh back in Romans, for example, it's always talking about sin. If we relate that back to, even to the Old Testament, we look at the uh, the Jewish ritual washings and when they did that, which is where baptism comes from. Uh, mm -hmm. It was represented like, you know, the sexual discharges that would go into living water so that way they can be cleansed. And of course, Jesus represented that living water. We dipped in him so that way our sins are cleansed for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, we're not, go ahead. Well, I was, can you share my, my Bible so I can actually bring up the Strong's? It's, it uh, should be sharing. My screen should be sharing. Okay. All right. It's probably in the word sarks, I'm sure. Yeah, I think that's right. Are you wanting to look up the 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 field? Well, no, the flesh. Moral depravity. Yeah, moral depravity, well, filth, dirt. I think this is where we're 
Yeah, I, I was, I, I knew that, may, you know, this is where we get into meanings of words, depending upon the context. And I know that you're, you're saying it's sin. And <clears throat> I would say that it's referring to a, the body, the physical body, that it's not about taking a bath. It's not about cleaning the physical body. It's about, I want to be saved. I want to be saved by the gospel. And, you know, without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know, baptism would be meaningless. Right? I mean, you would agree with that. Yeah, um, and if, if you don't mind me interjecting, I, I've heard I've heard that argument as well, respectfully. Uh, but, you know, it, according to a Jewish context, they would never look at that and say, well, that's just, uh, you know, washing of the body. We just never see that throughout history. Even if we go back into the Old Testament, when they did the Jewish ritual washings, it wasn't just, you know, taking a bath. It, it, it actually had a religious connotation to that, which was removing uh, more uh, immoral uh, depravities from your body. It had a it had a real meaning to that. And so when we look at that, looking with that, and looking at the context that Peter is an actual Jew talking to other Jews as well. We look at chapter one; they will not understand this as washing from the body. So I'm not underst I'm not understanding where you get the idea that this would be taking a bath. To a Jew, they would never understand it that way. Well, uh, but do you agree he's also speaking to Gentiles as well? No, go back to uh, First Peter chapter one, really quick. No, I I agree with you. He's speaking yeah. to Jewish Christians, no doubt. Yeah, the immediate, yeah, the immediate audience is the Jewish uh, Christians. Of course, we can apply stuff for this from from ourselves. But what I'm saying is, in order to get the proper uh, understanding of this particular text, we have to understand the audience that he's talking to. And if that audience doesn't understand that this is just a simple, you know. Uh, but bath, you know, washing a bathtub, we have to understand it from their context and from their context, they would never look at this as just like, oh, we're just taking a, a, a bath. No, no one would ever think that way. Well, I would say chapter four, I mean, I would, I would think you would, you would apply not just Jews, but Gentiles as well. Yeah, like I said, it's, it's, I believe it's applicable to all, but I'm just saying specifically, this is talking to the Jewish Christians, so it's important to understand from their context what it's saying here, so that way we can know how it can, how, how it can rightly apply to us as Gentiles. And if we understand it from their point of view, stating that, yeah, we understand it from their point of view that this is not just a simple bath, that this is not just washing in water then we can kind of understand like okay so how does this apply to us and so okay. when i look at when i look at this as a gentile i know that you know uh a ba baptism is not about taking a bath at all and then looking from their perspective this is not just simply about ritual washing this is this doesn't have like um the, this 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 water bath that i'm taking right now this baptism this water baptism doesn't have any merit whatsoever in and of itself the true salvation is in the blood of christ um, I'm going to reference just two scriptures really quick and just kind of uh, give some context to that. Titus chapter three, verse five, it says he saved us not by the righteous deeds with which we have done, but according to his mercy through the washing of new birth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And of course, there's a text that uh, Travis brought up during our debate, which was first Corinthians chapter 12, saying that we were in, uh, by one spirit. We are baptized. Nowhere in that scripture does it talk about water baptism, but it specifically talks about us being baptized by the spirit. So okay. that baptism was done specifically by God himself. So if we're talking about Holy Spirit baptism, that's all God. But we're, do, we're talking about water baptism. That is the work that we do in order to uh, uh, obey God. Okay. But that, that's, not, well, uh, that's not applicable to salvation. Let me insert something if, I, if it's okay. I apologize. Um, yeah, I know I took a lot of time. I apologize. It's all, it's all right. Um, so how we ended up at 1 Peter 3.21 was you wanted to reference 1 Peter 3.21 to support an argument that says baptism is a good work. And now we, we looked at it, people can see it, and I'm just not grasping how you are building that argument upon this passage. Because again, you're not reading the entire thing. That was the issue I told you before. Okay, the what, light part? Figure, what, what part of it? Read the entire thing. The light figure, which is talking about the symbol, which, uh, which, uh, sorry, the light figure were unto even baptism doth now save you, save us. Now you just stopped there. I read no, the verse. No. It Don't say I the, stop not, there. I've read you, the whole passage. You've Shane got it was quoted by the resurrection. Of I, I can pull. Christ. I can pull. I can pull up our debate. I can show you what I'm talking about. But it says not the putting away of uh, filth from flesh. Talking about sin, and of course, I'm, I can reference many good scriptures about that. But okay. the answer of a good conscience towards God by the now you stop right Christ. there. I want to keep reading. Who has gone into heaven? See, you didn't read it all. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him. 
How's that apply to baptism? Well, we must be subject unto him. Whatever he says, we must do. So you didn't read it all. See, I can throw that out there and try to. (laughs) Because again, we're we're talking about it all. Why didn't you read it all? Because we're talking about baptism. We're not talking about just being subject to God. Again, I totally agree that baptism is a command that we should do, just like evangelism is a command that we should do. Okay, uh, but what, this here, but this works in there. You're, 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 right, you're hey, still, let, you're still let me not ask a building an argument. Let me oh, ask a question. Colossians 2.13. When, 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 okay, during water place. baptism, when a person goes under the water during their baptism, are they receiving the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, God has fellowship, that God comes to have a relationship, fellowship with them, yes. Yeah, that's when you gain the spiritual blessings. Okay, Okay. so when that person is underwater, that's when they receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So it's water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism at the same time? Simultaneous? Holy Holy Spirit baptism... <laughs> wow, well, that opened up a can of worms. But that's yeah, that's the no, can that's of worms that we need to open, fellas. That is the can of worms we need to open. That's not what we're on, JP. We're on baptism. You don't ever want to go there, word. Travis. That's now, the problem. You've you got to structure you've got to the, go the conversation the in a certain find way. Where is baptism a good word? You've made the claim, and it doesn't no, say baptism is a good word. We did First Peter three twenty one. We we talked about that for it? the last thirty minutes. Look, where does it say baptism is a good word? Now you made the statement. You guys are trying to say bab- the Bible teaches that baptism it is, a, is, is, is a good a, word. It is Desmond a gave you supporting verses. Titus he supported and some others. right here, JP. This is the verse he went to. He, 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 ignored every, he ignored everything I said right there. But we can just go back and play the rest of the video if you want to see that. Yeah, you but can, the, you can the, go the, back the, and play. Like, where, the, where does the Bible say? It's what, not what like is, what is, what, Desmond, what is, you put your own interpretation Travis, of it. Travis, Travis, see, Travis. See, you're getting Travis, to talk a lot Travis, more than us. See, Tra- you've gone Travis. into two minutes explaining Tra- away this. Hold on. And see, you're not allowed. Hold on. Travis, I'm asking you a question. What does like figure mean? I'll put you on mute. What does no, like figure mean? This is a back and forth. We get to communicate with one another. You're not running. You you said we can work together on this. Exactly. But I'm asking Travis, a question. Shane, what does like figure Shane talked a lot. And I'm I mean, asking you the question. Where is baptism a good word? I'm showing you right now. What does like figure mean? I don't see it, Desmond. It don't what, say good word. Where are you getting that? <laughs> He's not... He, Travis, what does light figure mean? It means good work, I guess, in your interpretation. What, do know? what does light figure mean? Pull up your uh, strongs. Well, we already ran it. Light, light figure is the anti-type. It's a correspondence of what the passage had just said about the water and the ark and Noah. Okay? okay. So but the, was uh, Noah building the ark, was that a good work or was that a work of faith? That was a good work. A good that work, a good work, work of faith, eat the same thing. Oh, it is the same thing. Work of faith, yes. But so we're looking at this. Believe, says, is believing a good work? Believe, of course not. Oh, it's not. Believing but I can tell not, you where it is a work. We can we can go there in a minute, but let's let's finish this here. You want to go to uh, First Peter chapter twenty one, three to twenty one. Let's finish this up. No, you this wanted to go like, here. Actually, you did. So don't you, say I wanted to go on, here. Hold on, you still you want you want to continue. You want to continue. Travis, you and want see, to continue? this is what happens. You just get what? Okay, Let's hold work. on. I don't mind uh, coming back to this at some point. Uh, right, we we, we have to get back to this. We have to get back to this. But yeah. I'm, well, I'm yeah. just let me just answer Travis really quick before we, go, we move on. But the light figure we're unto even baptism now also now save us. Now you just stop there, Travis. You stop there. It says not the putting away from filth of the flesh. And I already gave up my points as far as what that means. You can look that up in the Old Testament, also in the New Testament. It says, but the answer of a good conscience towards God, this has nothing to do with us being saved by water baptism, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject. Since you want me to read the rest of that, made subject to him. I'm just curious. uh, Well, then what would it mean when it's showing in Acts 238 remission of sins? How do you get how do you not saved without, you know, having your sins removed? Sure. Let's you want to go there right now or you want? I would think I I would like for you to see where baptism is a good work. You ain't proved it. Hey, Michael, I think a better verse would be Acts 22, 16. Can you go there? I want to know how you reconcile this with acts 22 16. okay okay 
uh, before okay. we go to right. before we go to that, uh, uh, we've been asked to identify whether or not baptism is a good work. I think the ultimate authority on this issue would be Jesus. Jesus identified it as an act of righteousness in Matthew three fifteen. Good point. Okay, so is that a good work? Yes, by every definition and every type of lectionary that you can come up with. We're on Second it, Chronicle, it, or not we're, second. we're talking about good works of human merit. So, so baptism is basically not from God. It is what some man come up with. Is that what you're stating as a good work? <laughs> That is, that's horrible, Travis. That is, well, that, Colossians 2.12 well, that says that it is the work of God. Be, because here, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though. Because you re, repeat what you just said, because I thought that was, that was crazy, though. But go ahead, Travis. Can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, yeah. Okay, when Shane brought up the argument on the PowerPoint, he said a good work and a human merit, basically what humans can come up with to earn their that's salvation. Not, that's not what that work. means. That's not what that means. <laughs> So anything we do, even if we were like, okay, uh, God commanded Israel to be circumcised. That would be a good work according to the Old Testament. That's what the Jews were doing. Uh, of course, circumcision doesn't equate to salvation. God, God, he commanded them to do that, but that's not what that wasn't for salvation. Same thing with baptism. Baptism is commanded by God. We all agree with that, but it was never for salvation. It was in response to us being saved. That's the point. Even uh, though we have passion. Can I ask here. my question, please, to Shane? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're, I'm get, sorry. Go ahead. You're, you're asking. Okay, so Michael said he affirms that you received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit down in the water. Shane was about to give his explanation. I'd, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. When you're baptized into Christ, you come into contact with his blood. You're raised to walk in newness of life. So, I mean, therefore, you had to have, have fellowship with God, a relationship with God, being indwelt by him. Okay, so it's spirit. so it's both baptism simultaneous. It's it's water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism when you're under the water. Hope, uh, I'll let the Bible define what ho baptism and Holy Spirit is. I can I can I, I'll I'll do it real quick. Okay, know. fair enough. All right, fair enough. Now let, now Ephesians four five says one baptism. So right. so you're you're affirming that it's water, and yeah. and even though you're receiving the indwelling of the Holy Spirit while you're under the water, it's not actually Holy Spirit baptism. You're, I'm really um, trying to understand. No, 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 I'm I, not I, trying to prove a point. I think well, how, do you, how do you articulate that? I think you're equating baptism in the Holy Spirit with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Is that what I'm? Well, to, well, baptism means to be immersed. If I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that means I'm I'm immersed with the Holy Spirit. It's it's in me. It's a literal indwelling. Okay, I think we're having a confusion of a term. Well, what it is, Shane? JP is obsessed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, no, I, okay. I need to understand you guys, and you no, always I, avoid I the topic, I, Travis, because you want to steer the conversation in, a, in your direction. Let's go to some verses real quick, and I can show them. I mean, that's no problem. I mean, your all's your all's position is it only happened twice. It happened. Well, you with just the said that there's only the one baptism, but there was actually a baptism, of John, right? The baptism. I, did, of I didn't repentance. say that. I quoted a verse, and then I wanted his interpretation. Right? Yeah, I get I what know, you're saying. I know, just... that, I know that you guys say Holy Spirit baptism only happened at the upper room at Pentecost, and it happened with the Gentiles, right? Only twice in history. That's your position. Well, there's actually a third time by implication that we wouldn't learn. And that is Paul the Apostle. So yes, you're right, JP. Okay. So, but you affirm that we receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when we're under the water, but we shouldn't uh, label that as ho as Holy Spirit baptism or being immersed with the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm saying. I'm just trying to understand the language and, and how you do yeah, that. Yeah, I understand. I mean, right, I think Shane was going to try to go to some verses there to describe what the Holy Spirit is. So, yeah, you mind if I just go quick? I promise it yeah, won't take long. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I think we're all familiar with Matthew three eleven. You going to share it, Desmond? Oh uh, yeah, sorry about that one on there. Let me do it this way. And I guess I should ask a. I'll ask a question there. Um, so, of course, this is John the Baptist teaching, right? And we can read all gospel accounts, but I think um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Now, he's, he is speaking to those who are receiving John's baptism, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, right, yeah. 
That's right. But he, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, which is Jesus, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, uh, what's what is your interpretation of fire, real quick? Um, yeah, the the very next verse. Yeah, that's okay. separate. So that's yeah. that's referring to everlasting fire torment. Correct. Correct. Okay. So, so really, how you're reading this verse is, he shall baptize some of you with the Holy Spirit and some with fire. Because I don't think you would agree that you're being baptized simultaneously with the Holy Spirit and fire, right? Well, no, it's not, yeah, it wouldn't be simultaneous. I mean, yeah, believers will be immersed with the Holy Spirit or baptized with the Holy Spirit or sealed, and then others will never have that seal uh, um, and then go to the, the lake of fire. Okay. Well, what I'm trying to say is these are two different baptisms being... Yes, I, I affirm that with you. Yeah, the fire is is explained so, in verse twelve. We don't really have to explain the fire. It's it's the first okay. the first part of the verse. Yeah, and and Luke defines it for us. So let's go to Luke twenty four. All right, and just real quick with John the Baptist, when in in Mark one four, when it talks about uh, his baptism, it says a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Is the repentance for remission of sins or is the baptism for remission of sins? Are you saying the sins are washed away in the water or is it the repentance that brings um, remission of sins? Because the sentence structure says that the repentance is what's for remission of sins, not the baptism in the water. Well, I guess we go back to that. <laughs> yeah, Mark, uh, Mark 1, 4. I mean, I think that's the a really good starting point because that's where we first see water baptism and the baptism of repentance. So okay. repentance for, is a change of mind. For, and, it, and then it says for remission of sins. The, it, isn't the repentance what is for remission of sins, not the water? Well, the baptism is part of the repentance yeah, for yeah. Israel, and they had to change. They had to obey uh, John's teaching. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. like a Luke's but account. You would right? agree that the baptism came after the repentance, though, right? No, it was for the, the repentance. Act, the oh, act I of, think, the, yeah, the I act think, of the baptizing was repenting. It was. Yeah. Can we go to Luke 3, I think it is? Uh, it's Luke chapter 3. Well, I, I, yeah. just to, I just want to show the example. And, and when we get a chance, because uh, on that same top, we should go to Matthew chapter three as well, specifically on verse eight. But we should read the entire thing. But you can go yeah, first. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was thinking verse eight actually too. Luke three eight. Yeah. So he says, "Bring forth." Oh, sorry. Bring forth. Wait. Where? Okay. Yeah. Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Begin not to say with yourselves, "We have Abraham to our father," for I say unto you that God is able these stones to raise up children under Abraham. Now Amen. also axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people ask right. him, so, saying, okay. Uh, so John is looking for that repentance before he baptizes, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. You've got kind of a chronological order to the situation there. So when God sees that that person has repented, they're going to receive remission of sins before they actually hit the water. There's nothing magical hmm. happening in the water uh, because they've already repented before they hit the water. Okay, we we, we well, never well, taught well, JP well, that well, anything well. magical happens in the water. So I mean, again, that is another straw man that you throw out. It's not a straw man. He, he that verse shows that that John the Baptist was looking for fruits of repentance from the Pharisees and Sadducees, and and he never saw it. So he's like, no, I'm not baptizing you. I don't see any repentance. You haven't repented. So it clearly shows that repent comes before you get in the water. And when God sees us repent, we receive remission of sins before you even step foot in that water. Well, I mean, they have to ask what to do, right? Well, of course, everybody's going to ask what to do to be saved. We see that all well, throughout well, the New what, Testament. That's what I mean when you go to Luke, if you go back to Luke 3, sorry. <laughs> Go down. We didn't. We didn't touch on. So see, um, I mean, verse not verse ten. 
So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? And he answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. And then he talks to the tax collectors and so forth. I mean, we agree that they, they had to show fruits worthy of repentance. And, well, and, and Jesus said, repent and believe. Um, yeah. So, he, you know, he didn't say repent and believe and be water baptized, then receive remission of sins. I mean, but I'm just you, I'm just showing the, the chronological situation there. Well, I mean, what, here's a question for y'all. Would you agree that um, those that are called the apostles were were they baptized under John's baptism? That's that's totally shifting the conversation. I think. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to shift it's the conversation. Shifting I whenever you ask uh, quickly, the, the reason I'm saying that is I know Andrew was because he's a disciple of John, and we know that they would have been added automatically, so to speak, to the church on the day of Pentecost when it came, because the blood of Christ flows forward and it flows backward. So those who have been baptized under John's baptism during that time, who who were kept faithful, who kept a covenant relationship with God, would have received the remission of sins. I mean, oh, I, think I, to would... I totally agree with that. Yeah, I don't believe people needed to be. Um, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, they're covered. OK, uh, so let me. And I think Acts 238 is where we should go. I mean, I, well, I just I... kind of wanted to see what you would say about the order of repenting and, and John baptizing in the water. Um, I just wanted to get that out there. Okay. Well, oh, and you never, you never explained the Holy spirit situation in the water. Yeah, okay. Let, All right. Fair, let's enough, let, fair let, enough. Let's let Luke define what uh, baptism in the Holy spirit. So Luke 24, which we're going to go to. <laughs> I've got to go in about 10 minutes anyway. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, go ahead, Shane. Um, down, 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 down. Verse 44, I believe. Yeah. Now, uh, y'all agree that Luke wrote Acts, right? Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Yes. All right. Yeah. We're going to put these... I think it said that in the first verse, didn't it? Well, we're, we're going to put these two together. I mean, that's why I'm, why I'm saying that. Oh, okay. Um, verse, okay, verse 46. Uh, go down to verse 47. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, and that repentance and remission of sins be preached in his name and to all nations beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem to your and do with power from on high. So see, there's the there's the definition of, of baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's power from miraculous power from on high. Would you did he forget to did he forget to mention water baptism there in verse 47? Because it says repentance. And remission of sins, but I don't I don't see water baptism. I don't see faith alone either, boy. I don't know why you're believing that. <laughs> <laughs> Just but, that repentance, that repentance is the focal point there in that verse, not not the water. I'm just I'm just making that point. Oh. I think you know, one of the things uh like I, I preached a sermon lately and I called it that we should not eliminate any scripture. And I mean, I don't eliminate any scripture. I go to all the scriptures that talk about faith. That's y'all agree that faith is necessary for salvation, correct? Yeah, of course. It's the, yep. yeah. It is repentance. Is that necessary for in order to be saved? A person uh, has to repent. Jesus said, "Repent and believe." Amen. And we should we should define that really quick, JP, because you know uh, there may be differences there. But uh, well, we're gonna spend another hour doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, just I'm just giving my, my my really really brief summary, but uh, to repent, change of mind, of course, and if you really have uh, changed your mind and believed in Christ, you will have the fruits of repentance as well. So those acts should follow uh, the, the repentance as well. So now, Shane, when you brought up the promise there in Acts two thirty eight, when it says your children will receive the promise. Mm -hmm. are, are, is he talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit or is your definition of the promise, the promise Holy Spirit? Is that something different? OK, go to, uh, let's go to Acts 1. OK. Hey, so, so Acts 1. Yeah. So um, I, would say, I would say, JP, 
that Luke just defined baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's power from on high. Sure. And we see verses five through eight that if you look at the pronouns, it's speaking about the apostles. And so you see there, I mean, verse five, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Mm-hmm. Now, okay. many days from now. That's, the, that's equated with the power from on high. I mean, it makes sense. Hey. He may already believe this, JP. Do you, do you believe that the apostles were the ones that received the baptism? In the yeah, Acts yeah. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not big on the 120 or whatever. The whole area receiving it okay. there. That's a little suspect to me. I don't. You can't cram 120 people up in that room. So I've never really <laughs> gone that route. Um, so what, what about you, Paul Day? Do you do you believe? Because you, you know I have to. You, you've been kind of quiet. He keeps what, trying to drag Paul into it. <laughs> what do I? What specifically do I believe about now? About the 120, were they were they immersed with the baptism measure, or was it just the apostles in Acts two one through four area? Uh, the short answer is, if it wasn't everyone involved at the meeting, then the prophecy of Joel two could not be fulfilled. Joel two was specific mm-hmm. that the Spirit would be poured out on all flesh. Young men, old men, servants, maid servants, all the rest. So if it was just the 12, it would not be a fulfillment of Joel 2. And right. Peter and the 11 would be lying when they preached their first words, the people who were wanting to know what happened. Okay. Uh, but as, as far as the, the, that being only to the apostles, even Peter himself did not interpret those words that way when he quoted them again in Acts eleven sixteen and applied it to the situation in Cornelius. He quoted the saying that Jesus uh, quoted, as was previously mentioned, P- Peter mentioned in Acts 11 um, and uh, verse 16, that Jesus kept saying that over and over again, that John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he used that and applied that to the situation of Cornelius to prove that they were salvation by faith involved them as well. Peter did not have this hermeneutic that was uh, being proposed to explain this verse. They understood that the gift of the Spirit was to be the promised possessions of all who are being obedient to Jesus. That is an explicit statement in the Gospel of John. And it's also an explicit statement within the prophecies of the prophets of the Old Testament itself. The New Testament is nothing more than what the Old Testament had already promised would occur. So if your hermeneutic does not allow the promises of the Old Testament to come true, your hermeneutic is false, and you do not represent the church of Christ talked about in the New Testament. Paul, just real quick, in Acts thirty, Acts 2.39, the 3,000 that, that heard and believed the, the gospel, could that have fulfilled the Joel prophecy or no? It had to be fulfilled so me, back at the— So let's talk about that. Uh, go, to, go to Acts. So I, I think we're all in agreement the apostles received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you know that. So you remember that Peter said this is what was spoken by the prophet Joe, and we we kind of already summarized what's. Y'all would agree that that's miraculous activity that's going to take place, correct? Yes. Okay. Sure. All right. Can can you, you mind going there? What, what text? Uh, go to uh, go to chapter two, seventeen through twenty one. Acts Actually, chapter two. Yeah. And what verse was it? 17. 17. Okay. Okay. So if you keep reading, I mean, we all agree this is, and it, and you're right, Paul. It's not just the apostles that are, they're going to, uh, Paul, let me ask you this. Do you agree that the apostles laid their hands and people received miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit? It does not say that in Acts 2. It does not say that. In in one occasion, with the the instance of the Samaritans, and that was abnormal, they came because uh, it was an abnormality. They had not received the Holy Spirit. They had only been baptized. What about Acts 19? Do you agree that Paul laid his hands on them? Yes, that occurred. However, you're trying to use isolated instances to prove a general rule. And even in the case of the Apostle Paul, he was not laid hands on by an apostle. He was laid hands on by Ananias, and he was filled by the Holy Spirit. So no, it did not exclusively come through the laying of the hands of an apostle. 
we we can talk about Ananias and that later. But let me let me show you this. Well, not too. Not sorry, just, sorry to interrupt. Not too much though, because we're already running at two hours and fifteen minutes. <laughs> Man, this is juicy, okay. though. Uh, this, this is good. Look at verse thirty-three and then verse thirty-nine, and I'll be it. Okay. So verse thirty-three. Will we all? Uh, will we all agree that Peter is still talking about Joe's prophecy, the promise of the Holy Spirit? In verse thirty-three. Mm-hmm. He poured out this. We yes. Came out in here. So my question would be, if we were looking at this context, wouldn't it not be the case that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit was a miraculous gift that they received in those early days? For the promise is to you, Joe's prophecy, to your children, to all of our far off, the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's what that's what I brought up was that verse. It, yeah. He poured it out. He poured it out on the apostles in the upper room, and now we're seeing it in Acts two thirty nine. That's that's what I'm asking: is the three thousand that got saved right there by hearing the gospel? Do you believe they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? If you're if you're equating yes. now, here's the thing: if you're equating the gift of the Holy Spirit to the indwelling, the answer will be no. Okay, that's what I wanted to hear you speak on. So Acts 2, 38, 39, the, now, the 3,000 here in verse 41, actually, they did not receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The, no, the indwelling is discussed in a different context, in other contexts. But you did acknowledge earlier that when a person goes down in the water, they receive the indwelling, but it's it's mm-hmm. not the same measure as the apostles. I, I'm just trying to fit it yeah, all together. Yeah, well, I understand. Now, I understand what you're saying. It's a, it's not a, you would agree it's a non miraculous indwelling. Right. Yeah. I don't have the power the apostles have to raise from the dead and all that. But when I say indwelling, they, Peter says, repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You're saying that is the indwelling, but it's a common indwelling and it's not the power that the apostles received in the upper room. No, no, no. no. I'm sorry. I, I may have misspoken. I'm saying the gift of the Holy Spirit in this context is the miraculous gifts that the apostles would lay their hands on these early Christians. Because it's it's also defined in Acts 10. Uh, the so this, promise, so this promise in verse 39 is what? Is Joe's prophecy. Because if you look at the context, verse 39, the promise. The promise of the Holy Spirit, verse 33, which links back to Acts 2, 17 through 21. JP, what do you think the promise is? I think it is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I find strange about this is because he said, when you go down in the water, you receive this common indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But yet it's not. That's not what it is. I don't know. It's not it's not adding up. It's not making any sense. You don't think it's the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, when you look at Ephesians 113, when you heard and trusted, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. I mean, it just seems like all this like moving and twisting of the promise and the indwelling. And I don't see a clear answer on it. Well, Desmond, what, what washes away sins, the blood of Jesus or the gift of the Holy Spirit? Which one would you say? The blood of Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit, of course, comes with that. It comes with it. If you don't have the spirit of Christ, you're none of his, right? Exactly. That was uh, was Romans chapter five, I believe. Let me go and go back to it real quick. Okay. So, so how do you explain Acts 8 where these people had believed and they were baptized and they didn't have the gift of the Holy Spirit, which you say comes with the blood, but I would say that they are washed in the blood because they believed and they were baptized. Paul Day already made the case for that. That was just like one isolated, isolated incident. You can't make a general. Is, is that the Samaritans? Yeah, the Samaritans. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know the history of the Samaritans and the Jews. Nobody would have believed that they could be part partakers. So Peter and John had to confirm that. That's why they they had to wait, right, Shane? They had to wait until Peter and John uh, Mm -hmm. could could confirm that. That's why that happened that way, Travis. And that's why Paul's pointing out there's a certain reason for why that went down the way it went down. Same with the Gentiles. They, They wouldn't have believed that. And then when the Holy Spirit falls on him, you know, Peter's like, hey, who can forbid water? Let's let's get this thing, you know, completely done. So uh, do you, do you think there's that reasons is a, for it. 
So you think that's a good excuse to say this is a one-time thing and, and it doesn't really mean what it says? No, it means what it says. But can you find, yeah, it means what it says, but can you find other incidents the same way? Yeah. Like, this is a common thing. I can't. I can common? find another instance. No, I said, is this common? I've always common thought that you... Okay. I've always it, thought that you guys could teach your side a whole lot better if you could clearly explain your position on the Holy Spirit and the indwelling instead of, you know, some of some of your church denying the indwelling, some not, and then it's like the promise, the indwelling. You know, it none of it is adding up at all. It's not making any sense to me. I, I'll tell you what. I'll send you a link to some of my videos I've taught. Yeah, it won't do no good, Shane. I've already studied with him. No, we're all listening, and it just it doesn't add up. You say you received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit down in the water, but it's it's not really the indwelling. Um, well, no. We, just, all three of us saying, said we received the Holy Spirit. But now the last time I checked, you believed in the Father and Jesus. So do you receive them also when you were We're looking at Acts 2.38, and I'm asking, so did they receive the indwelling, exactly they receive the indwelling of the you Holy Spirit? You don't want to answer anything. When I bring it up, I'll be muted. No, we're, or, we're, we're exegeting the text, Travis. We're not going off on all these okay. weird questions that you want to ask. Weird we're looking question? at Acts 2.39. Hey, calm down, calm That's, down. Okay. I mean, seriously? Calm all down. Right. All right. For the promises to you, to your children, to all who are far off, even as the Lord our God shall call. If you look up the Greek word for call there, it's very interesting. It's used only in Acts 13, verse 1, which is used for a special calling to an office, which, you know, separate from me, Paul and Barnabas, for whom I have called, said the Holy Spirit. And so that's that's the call there. Okay, in verse 41, when they're added to the church, is mm -hmm. that 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body? Did, did these individuals right here get baptized into one body? Yes. Okay, and 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says the spirit does that, correct? Yeah, for by one spirit, through the agency of the spirit, because he, he revealed the word through the apostles and prophets, if we obey the instructions of the Spirit, then we, when we're baptized into Christ, we are added to the one body of Christ. So when they're down under the water, that's when the Spirit is baptizing them into the body. No, the Spirit does not baptize. That you know, I okay, think, see, this is where it falls apart. I, it's not a you can jump in. I, I feel here. like it it falls I mean, apart when I even try to walk through it step by step. We need it to, breaks down. Well, it's really interesting when you study the Greek word in. That for by for by one spirit, you read, look at the look at the surrounding context and see how that word is used. It's really interesting. It's 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 talking about how it's through the agency of the spirit. Um, how can I explain? But but it's happening under the water is is what you believe though, right? Well, I think another thing they, that would help. Why is there a pause? See, there should, if you guys can clearly explain this stuff, and, and Travis, uh -huh. you're getting all upset with me, but then there's like this pause when I'm asking a basic question. Okay. When are you baptized into the body, and is it under the water? And I get no answer. Okay. Because someone mm. can't actually pause to think about how to answer a question, JP. And it would help, oh Shane. If Travis, they as understand. much as you guys so teach on water baptism, that should be a softball question. With, uh, that should be a softball hey, question. Hey, 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 hold, on, hold on, guys. Let's, let Shane finish here because I think Shane was going to answer that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we're, we, have some, we have some different categories going on. We're confusing. Okay. I, I believe, I think uh, both – uh, Michael and Travis agree that there is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's non-miraculous. But then there's also the miraculous work of the Spirit, which was done in the early days of the apostles and prophets. And believe me, there's a lot in the, in the New Testament that is referring to that miraculous work of the Spirit that that is no longer applying to us today. I there you go. I think you would agree with that. Yes. yes you're, keep rolling, Shane, because you, you're on it. Okay. So 
What I'm trying to say is in Acts 2, that con that that context, just referring to that context, <laughs> it is not, it is not referring to the indwelling of the spirit. That's what now that's what I'm affirming. See, JP, that's why we're so hesitant on just jumping in, because so many people have some mi misunderstand things or think of things a different way than what now. Other other contexts in the New Testament do talk about the indwelling of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Other texts, but not the one in Acts two thirty eight and thirty nine. Does that make sense? Am I? Am yeah, I that was that was nothing new. I mean, I I totally understand, and I believe like you that common believers don't have the same measure of the Holy Spirit as the apostles did. These specifically in Acts two thirty eight to forty one, the three thousand are added to the church. We walked through, yes, the Spirit baptizes them into one body. So we agreed on that. Earlier in the show, well, you said, earlier in the show, when you said they go underwater, they receive the indwelling. Yeah, the common And you're indwelling. just you're just saying it's a common indwelling, or it's not really an indwelling. That's what I'm confused about. Well, let me, let me pause it right here, guys, because we're already at two yeah. hours and 26 minutes, so... Uh, <laughs> I'm, let me let me cut it off here because I know all of us got to go to work. At least you know most of us. <laughs> um, Michael, Shane, Travis, if you guys want to continue this uh, on another time, that'd be great. I wouldn't mind have this conversation. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you guys coming on. I appreciate y'all having us. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, uh, give you guys our contact information. You guys want to do another live? Because again, you know, we have a lot of people who are into this as well. So I think it was uh, helpful for them. Uh, but I do appreciate everyone coming on and just sharing your views. And I, I apologize if I uh, cut off some people, whatnot, or maybe I'll talk too long, but it's, it's easy to do that when you get kind of passionate over some stuff. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate being a part of this conversation. Any closing remarks? Uh, um, Shane uh, and Michael, if you guys got about 10 minutes, you come over to my YouTube. Okay. Anyone want to give closing remarks before we close this up? All right. No, I just I want to thank them. Yeah, um, it's been a fruitful discussion. Uh, me myself, I, just like Desmond, you know, we're passionate. Don't mean to be disrespectful at all. Just searching for some some understanding. Um, and I appreciate you guys coming over. And you're more than welcome to uh, to join our little group, uh, our message group too, if you want to have conversation. Okay. Well, thank you. And, oh, and Paul, and Paul, you've been pretty quiet. Any closing remarks you want to? <laughs> any closing remarks you got? Just want to say uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to discuss together. It's always a, a, a real joy and a lot of fun to be able to study the Word of God, no matter in what situation uh, we find ourselves in. Um, even though we may be uh, passionate and uh, disagree quite strongly on the issues, I hope there's been enough uh, questions and enough of a tension in the dialogue to, to show uh, where we come from and why we, we differ on the issues. And uh, we can let the audience decide um, who had the, the better answers and who had the, who has the better worldview. And um, I just appreciate the, the discussion and I wish nothing but the best for, for all of you. Thank you. Amen. Well said. Yeah. All right. Well, have a good night, everybody. Hey, good night, everybody. All right, guys. Hard to top that, isn't it?